Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is an honor to welcome all of you to this first ever White House Day of Action on Maternal Health. And I want to thank everyone gathered today, the members of our cabinet, including Secretary Javier Becerra and CMS Administrator Chiquita brooks Lashore. And I want to thank the members of Congress, the state and local policymakers, the business leaders, the nonprofit leaders, the medical professionals, the community organizers, the patient advocates, all of you. Thank you for your leadership and your tireless work. And thank you for your partnership and your commitment to take bold action to improve maternal health. This challenge is urgent and it is important and it will take all of us. And to put it simply, here's how I feel about this. In the United States of America, in the 21st century, being pregnant and giving birth should not carry such great risk. But the truth is women in our nation, and this is a hard truth, women in our nation are dying. Before, during, and after childbirth, Women in our nation are dying at a higher rate than any other developed nation in our world. And when we know that for some women, the risk is much higher, when we know that, we should do something about it. When we know that today, black women are three times as likely to die from pregnancy-related complications, we should do something about that when we know that Native American women are more than twice as likely to die from pregnancy-related complications, we've got to do something about that. When women who live in rural America, which has many maternal care deserts, meaning there are no maternal care facilities, and when we know that women in rural America, for that and other reasons, are about 60% more likely to die, from pregnancy-related complications, we need to do something about that. And think about it, regardless of income level, regardless of education level, black women, native women, women who live in rural areas are more likely to die or be left scared or scarred from an experience that should be safe and should be a joyful one. And we know a primary reason why this is true, systemic inequities. Those differences in how people are treated based on who they are, and they create significant disparities in our healthcare system. And when it comes to pregnancy and childbirth, these systemic inequities can be a matter of life and death. So let us all say unequivocally, Maternal mortality and morbidity is a serious crisis and one that endangers both public health and economic growth, which means everyone is impacted by it. Because just think about it. Mothers are the backbone of our economy, and their children are the future of our economy. We know that when women do not get the health care they need, Families suffer, communities suffer, and our nation suffers. In fact, one estimate suggests that the direct and indirect cost of poor maternal health care could total more than $30 billion, $30 billion in a single year. By the same measure, we know that when we invest in women's health, when we invest in maternal health, economic productivity increases and socioeconomic outcomes improve. It is clear, a healthy economy requires healthy mothers and healthy babies. I will repeat that. A healthy economy requires healthy mothers and healthy babies. And that is why today, on behalf of our administration, I am issuing a nationwide call to action to both the public and the private sector. Through this call to action, federal agencies, businesses, and nonprofits 
will join together and will work together to solve this crisis. So today, to kick off this effort, our Department of Health and Human Services and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid are launching a new initiative to designate birthing friendly hospitals. So this is a brand new designation. And the first designation that rates a hospital based on the quality of its maternal health care. In addition, more than 20 companies and nonprofits have pledged to invest more than $20 million in maternal health efforts domestically and more than $150 million globally. They have pledged to invest in remote care monitors for rural communities, to invest in innovative care models for the postpartum period, to invest in education programs for maternal health providers, and so much more. And we will build on these actions in the coming weeks and months. Now, I know we can all agree, we should all agree, that action is long overdue. We have all heard the stories, and some here have lived the stories. Stories of women who experienced pain only to be ignored. Stories of women who experienced postpartum depression only to be dismissed. Stories of women who had to be put on life support or receive a blood transfusion after blood transfusion and could not hold their newborn baby. These stories should compel all of us to take on this crisis, to change the systems and to challenge the status quo that has created this crisis. Now, many of you know this has been a big part of my life's work. When I was Attorney General of California, I established the Bureau of Children's Justice to prioritize the needs of our children and their parents and to mitigate against adverse childhood experiences. The point for me has always been clear. What affects the children of our communities affects all of us. As a United States Senator, I crafted one of the first bills in the history of the United States Senate to target racial disparities in maternal mortality and to take on the challenge of dealing with implicit bias in our healthcare delivery system. Together with Congresswoman Alma Adams, who is here with us today, I introduced the Maternal Care Act. Together with Congresswoman Adams and Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, I also introduced the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, a comprehensive bill designed to improve maternal nutrition, to expand affordable housing, and to extend our maternal health workforce to include more doulas and midwives. And for so many women, let's note, doulas are literally a lifeline. And so we must support all these healthcare professionals. And finally, with Congresswoman Yvette Clark, I introduced the Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act, legislation that would address many of the biggest issues that affect so many women, the underlying conditions that contribute to maternal mortality, uterine fibroids. And this is especially of concern for black women who are more likely to be hospitalized as a result of that condition. So each of these bills forms the basis for the historic investment in our maternal health care included in our Build Back Better Act. Our Build Back Better Act will grow and diversify the perinatal nursing and doula workforce, support the work of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. It will promote health equity by taking action from increasing funding for maternal mental health to investing in maternal health research at minority serving institutions. So here's but an example of what our Build Back Better Act will do. So currently in most state Medicaid programs, they only provide for 60 days of postpartum coverage for women. Our law will require state Medicaid and CHIP programs to provide a full year of coverage after a woman has given birth. Now, what does this mean? 
It means a full year of coverage for pelvic exams and vaccinations, for postpartum depression, screening, and regular checkups. According to a new report from the Department of Health and Human Services, this would cover 720,000 more people every year. HHS has also put out new guidance today to help states implement the extension. This action will save lives and it will change lives. Our Build Back Better Act represents the single largest investment to address maternal mortality and morbidity in our nation, ever. The House passed this bill just before Thanksgiving, and the President and I are confident that the Senate will do the same. So as I said from the start, in the United States of America, we must do everything we can to protect and to strengthen both maternal health and reproductive health. This is about the rights of women. This is about the future of our nation. And this will take all of us. And the actions we announce today are just the beginning. In April, here at the White House, I invited women who have experienced personally and deeply the tragedy of maternal mortality. Their stories were different, but they described a common feeling, a terrible feeling, the feeling of not being heard. On this day of action, may the women of our nation know, I hear you, we hear you, and we are here to take action. Thank you again. May God bless you, and may God bless America. Thank you. Please welcome the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. I'd like to begin by thanking the Vice President, Kamala Harris, and also mention to you that for her critical leadership on this and so many issues, we owe her a debt of gratitude. To the many people who have championed this cause for so long, out there when no one was listening, thank you very much for believing that we would finally pay attention. And a special shout out to the members of Congress who have made it their cause, their cause through the Momnibus legislation to make sure we got this through to the finish line. Every parent in this room knows the joys and challenges of those first months after your child is born. Celebrating that first laugh, soothing that first cry. Every parent deserves those moments. But here in America, far too many never get to experience them. With the best minds and technology, our nation's maternal mortality rate remains higher than most other developed nations in the world. In the US, more than half of pregnancy-related deaths happen after childbirth, during the first postpartum year. That's what happened to one of our own at Health and Human Services, Shalon Irving an epidemiologist for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and a Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Shalon died a few weeks after giving birth to her daughter in 2017. This question will forever haunt me, her mother says. How did my daughter end up a statistic? No parent should ever have to ask that question. And no one and no one should ever have to die after birth in order for us to take action. This is an issue personal for me. My wife, Carolina, 
is an OBGYN, a maternal fetal medicine specialist who has devoted her career to improving pregnancy care and outcomes. And her work is a testament to the motto, willing is not enough, we must do. At HHS, we're more than willing to take on this issue. We're doing it every single day. In September, we announced nearly $350 million in awards to every state across the nation to support safe pregnancies and healthy babies. We've approved Medicaid waivers to extend postpartum coverage in Illinois, Georgia, Missouri, New Jersey, and Virginia. We know how critical this coverage can be. In fact, our Office of Planning and Evaluation is releasing a new report today that shows exactly that. This study finds that if all states adopt a 12-month postpartum care, approximately 720,000 women in America under Medicaid would have access to full-year postpartum coverage. That, my friends, is a game changer. And in a few moments, CMS Administrator Chiquita brooks Lesure will be detailing new actions by the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services to tackle this issue, including critical guidance for states on implementing postpartum coverage. Of course, this is just the beginning. President Biden and Vice President Harris have made maternal health and equity a priority, especially among Black and Native American mothers. That's why the Build Back Better plan makes significant investments to reduce racial disparities and improve maternal health outcomes. But this is not a challenge that stops at our borders. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, every year, low and middle income countries, in, in those a year, in, in those middle income countries, more than 25 million women received inadequate or no antenatal care. Just as we invest in improving maternal and child health care here in the U.S., we need to continue the important work of partnering with ministries of health around the world to ensure that all people have access to quality health care. Before, uh, before Shalon Irving passed away after giving birth to her daughter, she wrote on her Twitter profile, I see inequity wherever it exists. Call it by name and work to eliminate it. Today, we heed Shalon's call to eliminate inequity in maternal health wherever we see it. Together, we know we can make progress and save lives. So the question then is, are we ready? Thank you. Please welcome CMS Administrator Chiquita Brooks Lashore. Thank you, Vice President Harris, Ambassador Rice, and Secretary Becerra. I am Chiquita Brooks Lashore, Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. As a mother, as someone who has worked to expand access to affordable health care coverage for children and families for more than two decades, and as the first Black woman to lead the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services, the issues of maternal health and health equity are top priorities. It is unacceptable that Black women and American Indian and Alaska Native women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women, especially when data shows that two out of three pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. Fortunately, CMS, through Medicaid and our other programs, is uniquely positioned to address some of the root causes, like inequities in coverage and quality of care, that impact maternal health in America. 
Through our programs, we provide health coverage for more than 144 million people nationwide, including one in five women of reproductive age through Medicaid, and cover more than 40% of our nation's childbirths. We also have oversight over much of the healthcare delivery system through which pregnant and postpartum women receive care. Today, I am proud to announce two important steps that we are taking to improve coverage and outcomes for pregnant people and their families. First, we will be starting the process to establish a birthing-friendly hospital designation that would be posted on our CMS Care Compare website to help families identify hospitals that have implemented evidence-based quality initiatives to keep pregnant and postpartum patients safe. Second, we are providing vital information to states to help them build stronger Medicaid programs, plan for postpartum coverage expansions, and make additional improvements to the pregnancy and postpartum care they provide. Today's guidance outlines an easier pathway established by the American Rescue Plan for states to extend coverage for postpartum people beyond 60 days to a full 12 months. The guidance we have released today will help states implement this option, which will be available beginning April 1st, 2022. But states do not have to wait. Several states have already decided that they can't wait until April to help families. Virginia, Illinois, and New Jersey have all worked with us to secure 12 months of postpartum coverage for their residents this year. We call on additional states to come forward and work with us to extend postpartum coverage as soon as possible. This postpartum period is a very crucial time with more than half of pregnancy-related deaths taking place after birth. That makes maintaining continuous Medicaid or CHIP coverage and ensuring people can access the care they need during the postpartum period a critical issue. This coverage will help people manage conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and preserve access to behavioral health care during this vulnerable time. Furthermore, CMS is working to improve access to and the quality of maternal health care holistically. We're making it easier to enroll and keep Medicaid coverage. We're partnering with states to expand coverage of childbirth supports, such as doula services, which have been shown to improve birth outcomes, like the vice president mentioned. We are expanding our provider quality measurement programs, and we're working to reward high quality care. We will work across the federal government with states alongside advocates and stakeholders to improve maternal health, advance health equity, and save lives. Thank you. Hi. My name is Anisha Hussain, and I'm the author of The Pain Gap, How Sexism and Racism in Healthcare Kill Women. Maternal health is important because it is an indicator of how well a country's healthcare system is functioning overall, and America's maternal mortality rates are amongst the highest amongst wealthy nations. It's frankly unacceptable. Um, we should all be invested in maternal health because, first of all, it's a crisis that is solvable this is what I always want to stipulate about maternal health and America's maternal mortality ratios. This is a battle. This is a fight that we can win. We already have the tools uh, to save women's lives and we know when to intervene. Um, no woman should be dying, giving birth in the richest democracy in the world. It's, it's frankly unacceptable and we should all be invested in maternal health because ultimately it reflects the health of the country. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Stacey Stewart. I'm president and CEO of the March of Dimes. Today, we all know that we're facing an urgent maternal and infant health crisis, and it's certainly only been made worse by the pandemic. That's why we're asking for Congress to take bold and decisive action, to extend Medicaid postpartum by one year, and to also pass Momnibus, which we think will comprehensively address and put a big down payment 
on reversing the maternal and infant health outcomes that we're seeing today, especially addressing the health inequities that we see. You know, we've been dealing with these health inequities for many, many years in this country. My daughter and I visited a slave plantation in Louisiana and were shocked to realize that back uh, during those times, childbirth was one of the leading causes of death on the slave plantations. Why are we still dealing with these issues today? We have to take action right now, collectively, to make sure that every single mom and every single baby is as healthy as possible. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diana Jellis. I'm a nurse, midwife, and healthcare researcher serving in Southern Arizona. I wanna take a second to remind us that the majority of childbearing people are healthy and of low medical risk. High performance healthcare systems involve investing in the communities, in promoting the assets and resilience and wellness that our communities currently have. Healthcare for healthy, low risk people should be very different than healthcare for high risk people. The answer cannot be found in a five minute clinical visit. We need a diverse interprofessional workforce that provides the care needed by people to build how well we're eating, how we're exercising, how we're preventing diabetes and cancer, how we're relating to each other in order to have healthy relationships to decrease stress. These are the opportunities that are upstream that our current healthcare system is missing out on. Hi, I'm Jamila Taylor, Director of Healthcare Reform and Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation. My vision for maternal health is that Black women no longer have to die of preventable pregnancy-related deaths. They have the care and support that they need and their families can thrive. But in order to get us there, we need comprehensive solutions like the Black Maternal Health Momnibus and the Build Back Better Act. We also need to root out systemic racism in healthcare. I believe with my whole heart that we can get there. And now is the time when I became a mom, I realized how little I knew about what women go through to give birth. When I faced my own complication, I learned how critical it is to have access to high quality, respectful maternity care. Maternal health is a human right. Every person giving birth deserves access to care, resources, and support that helps them to not only survive, but thrive. Here in the US, this is not always the case. We spend more money than any other country in the world on maternity care. And yet, right now, a woman is twice as likely to die from complications of pregnancy and birth than her mother was a generation ago. Black and indigenous women are disproportionately at risk. On this day of action for maternal health, and every day, we must work together to end this maternal health crisis. The movement towards maternal health equity is growing, and with collective action, progress is possible. To take care of our nation's moms and birthing families, we need a maternity care system rooted in equity, transparency, and accountability that truly centers the voices, priorities, and values of the people giving birth. Let's work together to make sure that every mother counts. Thank you, Vice President Kamala Harris, for inviting me to join this vital conversation on America's maternal health crisis, and for raising this issue at the highest levels of government. In America, the wealthiest nation in the world, every pregnant woman should have access to affordable health care without regard to who they are, where they live, or how they look. Yet the sobering truth is Black women in our country are three times more likely than white women to die from complications during pregnancy. It is long past time that we give serious attention to this crisis. We know housing insecurity harms pregnant women. The last thing a pregnant woman needs to worry about is where she can afford to put a roof over her head. Women who experience homelessness face significant challenges in finding care and are twice as likely to experience complications during pregnancy or birth. Too many women of color live in communities that lack affordable, high quality health providers. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is joining together with leaders across our government to address America's maternal health crisis. We are working with the Department of Health and Human Services to ensure that every pregnant woman who receives our support has access to affordable, high-quality care. In addition, 
we are working to break down barriers that prevent women in HUD assisted housing from finding maternal health providers who will listen to their concerns and allow them to direct their own care. The president, the Biden Harris administration will continue to advocate for the resources we need to advance safety, security, and equity for women in America. The president's Build Back Better plan provides community-based organizations with $175 million to address social determinants of maternal health, like housing and nutrition. It contains an additional $295 million to increase and diversify our nation's maternal health professionals, including our nurses, midwives, doctors, and doulas. This administration is proud to partner with you to ensure that every person has the chance to enjoy a healthy pregnancy and a healthy birth, no matter the color of their skin or the zip code they call home. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the next event in our Maternal Health Day of Action, a discussion entitled Building Back Better by Improving Maternal Health. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone here today and to those watching from home. In particular, I wanna thank the healthcare providers who are here with us today, who work so hard every day to keep patients safe and healthy, particularly in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. As was discussed during the last session, our country is facing a maternal health crisis. It bears repeating that Black and American Indian and Alaska Native individuals are two to three times more likely to die in pregnancy-related causes than white women. And similar racial disparities exist for pregnant people facing significant health conditions related to their pregnancy. This is simply unacceptable. And it's an important reason why the esteemed members of Congress on this panel are working so hard to build back better <laughs> by passing the Build Back Better Act into law. Among the other important provisions, the Build Back Better Act would require states to provide 12 months of continuous Medicaid and CHIP coverage to people after the end of their pregnancy, extending postpartum coverage for an estimated 720,000 people annually. The bill would also invest a billion dollars in new maternal health funding to grow and diversify the perinatal health workforce, including doulas, nurse practitioners, and providers of mental health and substance use disorder treatment. And it would provide new funding to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institutes of Health for Maternal Health Research, including on research that can advance health equity. We will talk further about the specifics of the Build Back Better Act's provision and why they're so important. But first, I'd like to give each of our panelists a few minutes to introduce themselves and the guests who are joining us virtually from around the country. Please also take a moment to share why this issue speaks to you personally. Senator Murray, let's start with you. Well, thank you so much, Administrator Brooks Lesher. I am so pleased to join you, Congresswoman Underwood, Congresswoman Kelly, and Congresswoman Adams, and Twina Nobles from my home state of Washington, uh, and so many others to talk about how building back better means addressing maternal mortality. It is unacceptable that our country has the worst maternal health death rate in the developed world, and it is an outrage that for years now it has been on the rise and is continuing to disproportionately affect Black, American, Indian, and Alaska Native women. In 2019, actually before COVID-19 hit, over 750 women in our country died from causes related to pregnancy, which was almost a hundred more deaths than the year before that. And the maternal death rate for black women was two and a half times higher than for white women. Additionally, the rate for the American Indian and Alaska Native American women is over twice as high as for white women. And according to CDC, almost two thirds of pregnancy related deaths are preventable. But we know 
too many pregnant women are not able to get the care they need. And even when they are able to speak with a health care provider, we know that too often women, and especially women of color, don't have their concerns taken seriously and are not listened to about the pain that they are experiencing. They deserve so much better. And while the need to address the reality of our nation's appalling maternal death rate and health inequities is already clear and urgent before this pandemic, COVID-19 has made it worse. This virus has been especially dangerous for pregnant patients. And due to the long-standing inequities in our healthcare system, it has been especially devastating for communities of color. It should be obvious to everyone we cannot build back from this crisis stronger and fairer if we leave mothers behind. This is a priority for women and families, and it has to be a priority for us. And that's what this event is about today. Finally, prioritizing maternal health and showing how much we can change when we have champions for moms at every level of government, from President Biden and Vice President Harris, who are prioritizing this like never before, to local champions like Senator Nobles from Fircrest, Washington, who I am so honored to introduce right now. Senator Twynan Nobles is the state senator for Washington's 28th district and the CEO for the Tacoma Urban League. Under her leadership, the Tacoma Urban League developed a program to address the challenges that women, especially black women, face in childbirth and support aspiring doulas and midwives in their community. Senator Nobles, I am so glad to have you with us today. Uh, I'm grateful for all you do for families in our state. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Senator Murray. I am so honored to be here today. And in the Urban League movement, we know it is racism, not race itself, that is a driving force behind um, disparately high rates of maternal and infant deaths among African-Americans. And it's fueled by both explicit and implicit bias. Income level, education, and socioeconomic status are not protective factors as they are for white Americans when it comes to maternal and infant mortality. Structural racism compromises our health. The combination of racism and sexism often result in women of color, particularly African-American women, consistently reporting experiencing bias and discrimination based on their race and gender and healthcare settings. And this compounded discrimination results in women, but especially women of color, feeling invisible or unheard when asking medical providers for help. And when expressing issues with pain or discomfort during and after the birthing experience. And this is why at Tacoma Urban League, we have decided that it is critical for us to ensure that Black moms Black mothers all across our county in Pierce County have access to proper health care, have access to their rights, and that we are fighting for justice at all times. We've been supporting several um, doulas and midwives in our community, from Maya and Chelsea to Stephanie and Nikita, making sure that we're offsetting the cost of doula experiences for parenting uh, members of our communities. We've made sure that we've welcomed all of our uh, moms and babies of color to our Moms and Babies Support Program that we call Being the Village. Um, it has been a tremendous opportunity to ensure that we are doing our part at Tacoma Urban League um, to highlight this issue, to make sure that we are increasing maternal health and working hard to eliminate maternal mortality. And so I'm grateful to be here and grateful to know that our US Senator Patty Murray is um, trusting in us and supporting us in the work on the ground in Pierce County. Thank you for um, allowing me to share a bit about our work and thanks for allowing me to join today. What a pleasure to hear from you both. Thank you, Senator Murray and State Senator Nobles. I'm now going to turn to Congresswoman uh, Robin Kelly. Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to be here today for this Maternal Health Day of Action. Thank you to Vice President Harris for convening this very important event. Before coming to Congress in 2013, I had no idea just how dire our nation's maternal mortality and morbidity crisis was. However, through my work in Congress, I was quickly exposed 
to so many tragic and heartbreaking stories about how the maternal mortality crisis is impacting people in this country and how it disproportionately impacts women of color. Anytime someone passes away from a health complication, it is tragic. But the reason the maternal mortality crisis is so frustrating is that so many of these complications are almost entirely preventable. I quickly realized that something had to be done. I first introduced the Mamas Act in the 114th Congress. The main focus of this bill was to increase the postpartum coverage provided in Medicaid, improving data collection, provide best practices guidance to states, and eliminate biases working against women of color in our healthcare system. In the 115th Congress, I was again working on this legislation and was happy to learn that there was a candidate running for Congress in Illinois who also had a strong interest in this issue. I actually invited her to one of my press conferences about MAMA. I was so glad to see that Congresswoman Underwood is here in D.C. with us, building on this work, as well as my colleague, Alma Adams. Of course, we're so honored to work alongside now Vice President Harris. When she was in the Senate and fighting to improve maternal health equity for black women and other women of color. I know we're going to hear some tough stories, especially from my guest, Tony Brown, who I will tell you more about in a moment. However, we're also going to talk about some exciting progress we're making with the Build Back Better Act. We've all worked so hard to ensure that our maternal health policies and investments are included in this bill. And I know we're looking forward to the positive impact these policies will have in our communities once this bill is signed. I'm thrilled that part of My Mama's Act has been included in this Build Back Better. This provision ensures that every woman covered by Medicaid will have access to a full 12 months of postpartum coverage, regardless of which state she calls home. One third of pregnancy and birth-related complications happen up to one year after giving birth, and many of these complications, such as hemorrhaging, are much more common among black women. Now women will know that they can go to see their doctor if something doesn't feel quite right, even if their baby was born six or eight months ago. This provision is truly going to save lives. I've been working to, sec to secure this for so many years now, and I'm thrilled that it's almost done. Build Back Better is a step in the right direction, but it certainly cannot be the end of our work. This is a problem that is worsening in our country, and it's costing us tens of millions of dollars per year on top of the previous lives it is costing us every day. Today, I invited my friend and former colleague, Ms. Tony Brown. Tony and I go way back. We used to work together in the County of Cook in Illinois. In 2017, Tony tragically lost her daughter to the maternal mortality crisis. And I'm so proud to have Tony here with us today to share her daughter's story and her perspective on the improvements we still need to save lives. Tony, I'm now going to turn things over to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about your experience with the maternal mortality crisis. And I just want to thank you so much again. Tony. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank Congresswoman Kelly, Robin Kelly for inviting me this morning to share my story. Um, my name is Tony Brown, actually Antoinette, but go by Tony Brown. And I'm sharing a story about the day that was supposed to be the happiest day of my life, but became one of the worst. I am the mother of one child, my daughter Nisi. Um, the day Nisi found out she was going to be a mother, she came to me so excited that she was pregnant. Nisi was very healthy. She had no issues throughout her pregnancy, with the exception of a little high blood pressure here and there. In her ninth month, her doctors decided that they wanted to induce her labor. She walked into the hospital with her fiance, very excited. Several family members were in attendance. Nisi and her fiance were only childs on both sides of the family, so this is our first grandbaby on both sides. Um, doctors induced her labor, and she was in labor for 18 hours. 18 hours of talking to her, um, praying with her, and a total excitement. Um, after 18 hours, the hospital decided to give her a cesarean, but that, but they wanted to keep her awake during the procedure so that she could keep her baby. So they prepped her 
for the C-section and she went in. After sitting in the waiting room for like three hours and wondering what was going on, the family was escorted to another room where we met our grandbaby. We found out then that there were complications during the delivery. The doctors escorted myself and her fiance to a counseling room and let us know that Nisi was hemorrhaging really, really bad and that they were going to have to give her a hysterectomy, and she, but that, you know, and that she wouldn't be able to have any more children. So we were upset about that, but we dealt with that. We just wanted Nisi to make sure that Nisi was okay. So we returned to the waiting room with our family and our new grandbaby. Two hours later, we were escorted to the same counseling room again. Uh, doctors said that they stopped the bleeding, so Nisi would not need a hysterectomy. However, she had experienced some breathing problems uh, with her oxygen for about three to six minutes. Uh, the anesthesiologist said that she noticed that Nisi wasn't breathing well, even before the equipment that she was hooked up to had detected that she wasn't breathing well. <sighs> My daughter was in a coma for four days. The final diagnosis presented to my family was that she was brain dead because she went without oxygen too long. So to this day, we still don't know why Nisi stopped breathing. And the doctors said they still don't know. So this was supposed to be the happiest day of my daughter and her fiance's life and mine since this was my only child and my first grandchild. It became the worst day, one of the worst days of my life. Yes. Thank you. Miss Tony, thank you so much for sharing your personal story and helping all of us understand what the stakes are. And we, I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you, Congresswoman Kelly, for your leadership in this area and for uh, so your long-standing leadership. Congresswoman Alma Adams will now turn to you. Thank you very much and good morning and let me extend uh, my sympathy to, uh, to the sister who told her story. Uh, being a mother and a grandmother, I certainly uh, feel for you. Uh, to Vice President Harris, thank you for hosting uh, this critical summit. To Administrator Brooks LaShore for moderating uh, the discussion, I thank you as well. And to my fellow panelists and to the invited guests who are here today to share why we must build back better by addressing maternal health. I'm Congresswoman Alma Adams, and I am so pleased to represent North Carolina's 12th Congressional District, more than 900,000 residents in Charlotte and Mecklenburg uh, County, as co-chair and co-founder of the Black Maternal Health Caucus and co-lead of the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, maternal health is extremely important to me <clears throat> and to the sustainability of our nation. About 700 women die each year because of complications in pregnancy and childbirth, and sadly, approximately 60% of, of these are preventable deaths. Our nation is one of only 13 countries in the world uh, where the rate of mater maternal mortality is worse than it was 25 years ago. But what's more disturbing is that across the country, black women, regardless of socioeconomic status, are dying from preventable pregnancy-related complications at three to four times the rate of non-Hispanic white women. And research also suggests that the cumulative stress of racism and, and sexism undermines black women's health, making them more vulnerable to complications that endanger their lives and the lives of their infants. And for me, my work in black maternal health began when my daughter, a black mom herself, survived the complicated pregnancy that almost claimed her life after her complaints of pain in her abdomen were overlooked by her physician. An overlooking pain of black women in healthcare results from implicit bias and racism, and higher amounts of implicit bias result in lower quality of care. These disparities also impact other groups like Hispanic and Asian and Native American birthing people who also experience pregnancy complications at a higher rate than white women. And so to address this issue, 
The Build Back Better Act includes all eligible provisions of the Momnibus, making historic investments to address social determinants of health and to fund community-based maternal health organizations and support moms with, with mental health conditions and substance abuse disorders, just to highlight a few. The Build Back Better Act will save lives and help American families avoid the devastating loss of a mother, a sister, a daughter, a aunt, or a friend due to pregnancy-related causes. I'm so pleased now to introduce my guest today, Dr. Ann Newman, a board-certified specialist in psychiatric nursing and a very good friend. Dr. Newman has practiced therapy in the community for over 40 years. And like myself, she is also an educator, teaching for three decades at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, Dr. Newman has also taught courses on psychiatric mental health nursing as well as a health policy, and she developed uh, the university's online graduate program in nursing education. You can tell she is a bright woman. She brings to the panel an in-depth understanding from the perspective of educator, professional nurse of the maternal health crisis, and I'm so pleased to have uh, Dr. Newman join us today. Well, thank you, Dr. Adams, for the opportunity to talk just briefly about my interest in maternal child health. And in my practice as a psychiatric mental health nurse and therapist, and looking at the social determinants of health that I know, conditions in the places where people live and work and play affect a wide range of health and quality of life risks and the outcomes in maternal mental health, which is my area of expertise. And that's what I'd like to speak to you about now. The prevalence of perinatal depression, or PND as we call it, is 15 to 20%, 15 to 20% of women. And that is probably an underestimate because most depression goes unheard and unattended to. So it may be larger than that, which makes it a very serious public health issue and consequently uh, important to the community. The, the adverse consequences of perinatal depression for mothers and their families necessitates the need to identify those at risk. And obviously those that are at the highest risk may need medical care and even hospitalization, but they should be identified much sooner than that. And because all women are at risk for pregnancy-related depression, universal screening should occur during the pregnant and the postpartum time period. Now, it's important that we consider the mother and the infant to be as a unit, particularly in the first unit first few months of life because what affects one affects the other. Thus, universal screening is recommended by our U.S. Preventative Task Force. And we have made substantial uh, improvements in that area in that we are now testing women for depression before the overt consequences occur. Uh, maternal depression has been demonstrated to be and contribute to multiple early childhood functioning. We know that children of depressed mothers are at least two to three times more likely to develop adjustment problems, including mood disorders of their own and developmental problems. So we know what it is. We can screen it. And the question becomes, how do we deal with it? And I've heard reference to this from other panelists, but we first need to ask the mom, ask the mom, what do you need? And that's what I did and that's what I do. And I'd like to share with you a bit about what they told me. Here are some of their quotes. I expect support from my partner and family. It's expected and should be provided without my having to ask, she says, sobbing into the phone. 
and others with perinatal depression who said, no one brings casseroles and holds your hands when your brain gets sick or calls you to see how you're doing. Or as another pregnant mom said, will my family think less of me if I need medication for a while? And furthermore, we have good studies that exactly what these moms said, identifying support needs and expectations of these new mothers is critical for moms to recover after childbirth. And these findings signify the need for public health nurses and others to be mindful of the importance of support for mothers in these early postnatal period. Recovery can be facilitated by helping mothers identify the types of support they need and who is best from their own social network to provide specific supports. So facilitating and helping mothers to mobilize their social networks is where we begin. Reinforcing what I call their mothering self-efficacy, that confidence that they developed to be a good mother should not wait until they are having a postpartum depression. People can learn to manage their own environment in regard to better mental health and well being. And this is part of my overall philosophy. Pregnant women with mild or moderate perinatal depression can self manage their environment if we listen to what they tell us and help them learn to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Adams. And thank you, Dr. Newman, for making such critical points about the importance of listening to mothers and, and mental health, and also the link between mothers and children and how important the health of both is uh, for each other. I'll now turn to you, Congresswoman Underwood. Well, good morning. Administrator Brooke Flesher, thank you for the introduction and thank you for moderating this important conversation and for your leadership at CMS to save moms' lives. I'd also like to thank Vice President Harris for convening today's Maternal Health Day of Action Summit here at the White House. The Biden-Harris administration has done more to raise awareness and take action to address our nation's maternal health crisis than any other administration in American history. I was honored to work with Vice President Harris when she was in the United States Senate and joined me to introduce the Mommy Bus in the 117th, I'm sorry, the 116th Congress. Now in her role as Vice President, she's continued to carry this urgent mission forward, including by working to ad advance every eligible provision of the Mommy Bus in the Build Back Better Act. And to Senator Murray, my Illinois colleague, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, and my Black Maternal Health Caucus, co-chair Congresswoman Alma Adams and our invited guests. Thank you for all the work that you do on this issue. I'm excited to be with you for today's panel discussion. Like many of us gathered today, my motivation to address the U.S. maternal mortality crisis is immensely personal to me. It's about my friend, Dr. Shalon Irving. I first met Shalon on my first day of graduate school at Johns Hopkins University in our master's in public health program. She was smart, she already had two PhDs, and she was joining our class to learn more about health equity. Upon graduation, she became a lieutenant commander in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. And in 2017, as I was wrapping up my service in the Obama administration, Shalon was preparing to give birth to a beautiful baby girl named Soleil. And then three weeks after she delivered Soleil, Shalon died from complications due to high blood pressure. And I remember being at her funeral and the director of the CDC was there, Shalon's mother was there, family and friends and her baby girl, and we were all stunned. Like, how could this happen in the United States of America with a uniformed public health service officer who had dedicated her own career to ending health disparities? And I knew that if I won my race in Congress, that this would be an issue that I want to work on. And so I'm so blessed to be able to work with Congresswoman Adams on our Black Maternal Health Caucus, and so blessed to be able to work with Congresswoman Kelly on these Medicaid postpartum expansion to make sure that this doesn't happen to other families in our country. 
And Shalon's story, like so many others that you'll hear throughout today's summit, are heartbreaking. But today's panel is a reminder that this is not a problem without solutions or a crisis without hope. All across our country, there are community-based leaders and organizations working to save lives and advance true birth equity for every family. One of the people on the front lines of this work in my state of Illinois is Carrie Stewart. Carrie is a certified nurse midwife and the director of midwifery services at the University of Chicago Medical Center. And I am so delighted that Carrie could join us today as my guest for the summit. And it's my honor to turn it over to her now. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Underwood, and thank you to the Biden-Harris um, administration for highlighting the importance of this topic today. Um, as Congresswoman Underwood stated, perinatal workforce investments are vital to solving the Black maternal mortality, mortality and morbidity rates in our community. Research shows that racial concordant care is not only evidence-based in desired health-related outcomes, but it is what the birthing community desires and seeks out when looking for um, prenatal care. And what racial concordant care is when a patient and provider have a shared identity. Uh, recruitment, education, and financial support of melanated providers is imperative, specifically melanated midwives like myself. The majority of certified nurse midwives or certified midwives in the United States identify as white, and that's about 85%, and as non-Hispanic or Latino, which is about 89%. Um, midwives of color, specifically Black or African-American midwives, only make up 6% of our um, workforce population. Um, this is not reflective of the populations that we serve. And so as a melanated midwife serving a melanated community, I am often told by my melanated patients that they desire a midwife because of better outcomes. But a midwife of similar ethnicity, racial background, or identity uh, because they want to feel safe and have a provider they can relate to during their prenatal care. There are just not enough melanated midwives to assist in combating this maternal crisis, and that needs to change now. Um, you know, the workforce, we have been intentional in, in our state of Illinois, um, specifically with my work at Melanated Midwives, um, to diversify this force, to financially support midwives as they continue on their education. And I'm grateful for Congresswoman Woman and this administration in making sure that we are considered in this, um, this act here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Congresswoman Underwood. And thank you so much, Carrie Stewart, for highlighting just the importance of providers uh, and particularly those who have a similar lived experience and how important that is for people and patients. I'm now this, and thank you all of you for, for giving us a sense of your perspectives and sharing your stories with us. I'd like to take a moment and give each member of Congress just a, a minute or two to talk about the specific uh, provisions of Build Back Better Act that you've been working, uh, working so hard to pass uh, into law. And I'll start with you, Congresswoman Underwood, just to talk more about how you've highlighted the importance of the maternity care workforce. And please just take another moment to tell us how important those provisions are. Thank you. Well, throughout today's panel conversation, one of the key points that's come up repeatedly is the need to grow and to diversify the perinatal workforce to ensure that every pregnant person in America has access to care and support from someone that they trust. And that's why State Senator Nobles launched a midwifery and doula program through the Tacoma Urban League. It's why Carrie Stewart is working so hard to increase the number of black midwives in Chicago. And it's why one of the core components of my Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act is a robust maternal health workforce investment, which is included in the Build Back Better Act. The need is urgent. The March of Dimes uh, published a report last year uh, describing how more than 2 million women of childbearing age in the U.S. live in maternity care deserts, counties with no hospital offering obstetric care, no birth center, and zero obstetric providers. Two million women. 
millions more live in areas with limited access to maternity care. And the consequences are significant. Research shows that when pregnant people lack access to obstetric providers or can't receive culturally appropriate maternity care, their risks for adverse birth outcomes are much higher. And that's why the nearly $300 million to grow and diversify the perinatal workforce in the Build Back Better Act will be so impactful. These historic Momnibus investments will ensure that no matter where a pregnant person lives, they can receive high quality, culturally appropriate care during and after their pregnancy. The funding will support nurses and midwives and nurse midwives and physicians. There's also funding specifically for doulas who provide critical peer-to-peer -peer support services for families throughout the prenatal and postpartum periods. Research shows that doula-assisted mothers are four times less likely to have a low birth weight baby, two times less likely to experience a birth complication, and significantly more likely to initiate breastfeeding. And there are also investments in the Build Back Better Act from the Moms Matter Act, a momnibus bill that provides unprecedented funding for the maternal mental and behavioral health workforce. Now in Illinois, our most recently published maternal mortality and morbidity report found that mental health conditions and substance use disorders were the leading cause of pregnancy-related death in our state. By expanding the perinatal mental health workforce, we will ensure that everyone experiencing postpartum depression, anxiety, a substance use disorder, or other related conditions has access to the care and the treatment that they need. All of these critical perinatal workforce investments build on the key provisions highlighted by my colleagues to comprehensively address every driver of maternal mortality, morbidity, and disparities in America. In fact, by passing the Build Back Better Act with every eligible provision of the mommy bus and permanent year-long postpartum Medicaid coverage in every state, we will be making the largest maternal health equity investment in United States history. Now's the time to get the Build Back Better Act passed in the Senate so that President Biden can sign it into law and we can continue saving moms' lives. Thank you. Congresswoman Adams, can I ask you to highlight the mental health and substance abuse disorder provisions? Thank you very much. The momnibus provisions in the Build Back Better Act invest a historic $1.1 billion to address numerous dimensions of the mental health uh, uh, crisis. Uh, the Build Back Better addresses social determinants of health, economic and job stability, housing stability, climate, transportation access, access to education, food security, community engagement, social integration, discrimination, stress and access to quality and affordable health care that influence maternal health outcomes. Funding community-based organizations and working to improve uh, mental health, supporting moms with mental health conditions and substance abuse disorders, and many, many more. That is a comprehensive approach to this crisis and something that we have never tried before. And this is important. It's vital that this cannot wait because of the moms' lives that we will save. And now we know from maternal mortality review committees that have examined pregnancy-related deaths that, that mental health conditions are one of the leading causes of pregnancy-related mortality. As Dr. Newman just mentioned, maternal uh, mental health conditions, such as perinatal depression, are highly pre prevalent and a public health issue of concern. Now, according to a study uh, in the American Journal of Preventive Me uh, Medicine, mental health conditions such as depression after childbirth can affect the financial stability and the economic welfare of mothers for many years. Uh, perinatal depression affects 13% of childbearing women in this nation, so that the link between financial well-being and mental health makes this concerning for mothers and their infants. The research found that maternal depression experienced in the year after childbirth had a sustained association with economic hardships like inability to cover medical costs, 
utility shutoffs, being unable to pay bills and housing and food insecurity up to 15 years later. So mental depression is also associated with unemployment and poverty. These challenges are even more pronounced in low-income and black households and among families of color, a disparity that is addressed by the Biden Build Back Better Act. Build Back Better includes my bill, the Kira Johnson Act, which will provide funding to community-based organizations and provide support for pregnant and postpartum people with maternal mental health conditions and substance abuse, uh, substance use disorders. And by including the bipartisan Moms Matter Act, led by uh, Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester and uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, the Build Back Better Act will additionally invest in community-based programs to provide mental and behavioral health treatment and expand the, the, the maternal, mental, and behavioral health uh, care workforce. So programs and community improvements implemented by community-based organizations, uh, if we do that, we can change the outlook for America's birthing people. We can improve financial outcomes and, and mental health uh, well-being and the conditions where mothers live, moms live, and, and will hopefully uh, raise their children. So the Build Back Better Act's uh, maternal health funding will give us a return on investment to change the lives of American mothers and positively impact America's families and well-being beyond our years. It's really about quality. Because when we think about uh, the words of Martin Luther King, who said that of all of the forms of inequality, Injustice in health care is the most shocking and most inhumane. Thank you. Congresswoman Kelly. Thank you so much. Based on my Mama's Act, the Build Back Better Act includes 12 months of postpartum Medicaid coverage in every single state. This builds on the coverage um, that was in the American Rescue Plan, even though that coverage was only for five years, so it wasn't permanent, and it gave states the option. This will make it permanent, and this will make it forever. Um, over one half of uh, births are covered by Medicaid, and for black women, it's 65 percent of births are covered by Medicaid. So you can see the disproportionate effect and why it's so important that women have this coverage, and not just 60 days after birth, but uh, a year after birth, because many things happen after that time. So we have to make sure that women feel comfortable uh, and have coverage and going back to the doctor. This bill, this particular part of the bill, without question, will definitely save lives and save families. So, uh, we, as I said, we worked very hard on this. I'm glad it went from what it was in the American Rescue Plan into the Build Back Better Act. And as my colleagues have said, these provisions in this bill will save mothers' lives and save families. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Murray? Yeah, thank you. You know, you can't solve a problem if you aren't acknowledging it and researching it mm -hmm. and gathering data and assessing it carefully. Um, but for a long time, that has not been happening. And maternal health wasn't a priority for our medical system. The people deciding what to research or who to focus on or what data to collect weren't people giving birth and they weren't paying enough attention to the challenges that pregnant women face. So the result today is we are way behind where we need to be. That's why I've been working to make sure that we have strong information and information sharing. And we are listening to pregnant people from all backgrounds, looking at what helps keep our mothers safe and what puts them at risk during and after pregnancy and working to put those findings into action. For example, Build Back Better supports perinatal quality collaboratives and maternal mortality review committees. That sounds like a lot of words, but what it means for families is having a group of experts focused on how we help people have a safe pregnancy. And we have seen how having experts collaborate and share information can help successfully reduce severe complications or bloodstream infections in newborns and deliveries before 39 weeks. And dedicated expert review is vital to understanding what contributed to a death, so action steps can be taken to reduce the risk of harms to people during pregnancy and in the year afterward. 
Build Back Better will support work at the CDC to help states and tribes and territories strengthen those resources and promote diversity and better understanding of the many factors that are contributing to increased risk of maternal mortality so fewer women die as a result of having a child. You know, we also have to make sure we make good use of the data we collect if we want to be able to understand and act on what it's telling us. Well, the CDC has a monitoring system to collect information on what pre pre pregnant people are experiencing before, during, and shortly after their pregnancy. Build Back Better will help improve that system and transition it to an electronic format so it's easier for everyone to use and make sure the system supports reporting for COVID um, specific experiences. Build Back Better will also fund research at the National Institutes of Health to look at how we mitigate the effects of COVID-19 on pregnant people. And of course, protecting pregnant people means not just looking at the challenges they are facing now, but being ready to protect them from threats in the future, which is exactly why Build Back Better will support work to understand and protect pregnant women from the environmental impacts of climate change like extreme heat and air pollution and from emerging threats so we can be better prepared in the future than we were at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in short, if we want to make progress, we need to prioritize maternal health throughout our entire medical system like never before. And Build Back Better does that by supporting programs dedicated to looking at what is happening to pregnant people, listening to all of our communities, gathering the data and actually getting the answers we need to improve health care for mothers across the country. Thank you again to the members of Congress for your hard work on this incredibly important issue for highlighting the provisions of Build Back Better. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your perspectives and your stories. And hopefully we will all be back here again soon to celebrate the passage of the Build Back Better Act and celebrate what that means for mothers and children across America. Thank you. Kentrice, hey, it's Dr. Miller. It's so good to see you and CJ. It's so good to see you too. How you doing, Dr. Miller? I am good. I'm so excited to share your story that was so impactful for me and my colleagues and I know our community. Um, and so I'm gonna jump right in and ask you some questions Everyone. about your experience when I first got to know you, okay. um, which was when you were in our hospital, uh, in our ICU, in fact, with COVID. Tell us what that was like. It was probably one of the worst experiences of my life, if I'm being honest. Um, I number one, there there are three things when you when you're pregnant in general, it's super stressful, right? You're carrying a life. Your goal is to carry full term, have a successful and safe delivery, but then to be pregnant while well, COVID, the COVID pandemic is going on is another, is a whole nother layer of stress. And then to be a black woman in America while pregnant during COVID is, um, was a level of stress I had not even been prepared for. And then to get COVID and be placed in ICU and placed on oxygen and away from all of my family and friends and totally separated from my entire support system was, uh, it was, it was devastating, you know? Um, and, um, and as you know, uh, I had bilateral infiltrate. I not only had COVID, but I had pneumonia in both lungs, which landed me in the ICU on, um, on oxygen, which I remained on throughout my stay uh, at the hospital. Um, but to, to say the least, it was devastating. And there are still some residual effects that I have from COVID even now being home. That's, oh, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, it was scary for us as providers, so I can't even mm -hmm. fathom what that lived yeah. experience was like for you. I I know eventually we got you out of the ICU and we brought you over to, hi CJ, yeah. to over to our, our women's hospital. And around that time, we started to have conversations around vaccination. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like and your decision, um, you know, before about vaccination and then why you eventually decided to get vaccinated? You know, there were a couple of things that made me decide to get vaccinated. Um, to be honest, the level of research that was out at the time, um, I, I just didn't feel comfortable with it because I knew that my husband and I wanted to immediately try for our second right after our first. And so I didn't want to have any issues with, you know, sterility or anything like that. So that was my apprehension. 
But once I started seeing doctors and nurses that had been vaccinated and were pregnant, it changed my idea about it. Um, and then also during my time in, in the hospital, um, they took me down for an MRI and learned that like 75% of my lungs had been impacted by the pneumonia. And so I had to think about what would my life be like? And if I got hit with COVID again, would I survive? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to increase my survival rate and the survival of my son. And so that made me decide to, to go ahead and get the uh, vaccination while hospitalized. What a powerful story. And it looks like, I mean, you look like you're doing fantastic. CJ is the most adorable kid. How are you guys feeling? I'm, we are wonderful. You know, he helps me live life in color. You know, it transformed, it transformed my life. You know, it forever changed me. And I'm so much more appreciative of the life that we have now. You know, um, I'm a later in life mom, so I'm already super patient, but this, this, this changed everything for me. He's doing great. He's thriving. He was actually born almost a month early, but he's literally almost six months and over 20 pounds. He's thriving. He's hitting all his milestones. Um, and giving birth to him was the easiest part of this process. Mothering him is easier than being hospitalized with COVID. That's, that's such a good message. And I, I guess, you know, you've, you've lived through this and yeah. you, everyone can you know what it's been like. It's such an impactful story. What would, if you had the opportunity, what would you tell other pregnant people who are not yet vaccinated? I would say it's it, it's better to fair with it than to fair without is that, it. Is that a like, mic? We're the ones that being is, severely like, impacted. You, you already have so many it's issues breathing no. as yeah, a pregnant a woman. And then right to have now, COVID that take that away even in. more um, it yeah, was, is, is super devastating. Hey, I would say me? take your chances with it. I didn't have, I had some minor symptoms when I got the vaccine, um, but... You know, I was fine after 24 hours. Um, I'm looking forward to getting the booster shot. And my only regret is that I didn't get it sooner, you know, because maybe I wouldn't have been hospitalized and I wouldn't have had to give birth on oxygen with a team of doctors waiting to uh, make sure that everything went, you know, according to plan and that we both were safe. So I would say it's worth it to, to get vaccinated now. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's such an important message. And Kintree says, you know, I work with the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. That's a, the nation's leading group of high-risk pregnancy experts. And we have continued to recommend opportunities for vaccination before, during, and after pregnancy. So thank you for articulating your story and sharing it with us. The pleasure is all mine, doctor. I really appreciate you so much. Thank you for everything that you did for me and my son while we were in the hospital under your care. It's absolutely my pleasure and getting to see him now. So fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
When I went to the hospital, distraught, I was disbelieved and sent home. If my family hadn't encouraged me to go back, I don't know what would have happened. Giving birth nearly killed me. And while I'm grateful to the medical professionals that saved my life and the life of my boys, I'm still processing everything that happened. But also real talk, I'm a white cisgender woman. My experience was a mere taste of the routine barriers to healthcare that women and pregnant people of color face. Black women are three times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. Maternal mortality rates are also higher for Asian American and Pacific Islander women, American Indians and Alaskan Natives for both women and pregnant people. This is a crisis. Historic investments from the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act are included in the Build Back Better Act. And it's one of the myriad reasons why NCJW calls on this. Hi, I'm Latham Thomas, founder of Mama Glow and the Mama Glow Foundation. Our work is dedicated to educating doulas and increasing access to doula support for birthing individuals. One of the ways we can address the Black maternal health crisis in this country is to improve access to BIPOC and LGBTQ plus midwives and doulas. There are 14,000 midwives in the USA. 6% are people of color and 2% are Black. We need more midwives and doctors who look like us to provide culturally competent care. We need to feel safety and dignity in the childbearing process. The data shows that doulas improve birth outcomes and are an essential member of the birth team. We need to increase access to education, scholarship opportunities, and professional development resources for people that are pursuing careers in birth work. We also need to remove the systemic barriers and make it challenging for midwives and doulas to do their very important work. Everyone deserves to feel safety, dignity, and empowerment in their birth journey. Together, we can be a part of that solution. I'm Jonathan Webb, CEO of the Association of Women's Health obstetric and neonatal nurses. Improving maternal health is essential because frankly, every woman, pregnant and birthing person deserves to receive care in a system that values their individuality, hears them and prioritizes their needs. Receiving this type of high quality, customized care saves lives, supports the birth of healthy children and has a tremendous impact on families and communities alike. The US has one of the worst maternal mortality rates in the developed world. This should outrage us and inspire action at the thought of even one lost life during what should be a joyous occasion, childbirth. We should be even more appalled with the facts that more than 60% of pregnancy-related deaths in the U.S. are preventable, and that Black women are dying three to four more times more often from pregnancy-related complications than their white counterparts. We must address this urgently. It impacts us all. Lives are literally at stake. On behalf of the women, pregnant, and birthing loved ones in our lives, and the patients who trust us with their care, we must ensure that we get this right. I'd like to thank the Biden-Harris administration for prioritizing maternal Hi everyone, and thank you all for joining us here today. My name is Rohini Kosolu, and I am Domestic Policy Advisor to Vice President Kamala Harris. It is my pleasure to introduce our next event in the first ever White House Maternal Health Day of Action, a conversation between Vice President Harris and Olympic champion Allison Felix. Maternal health, and more specifically, the health of our nation's mothers and children, have long been a passion for both of these women. We will hear first from Vice President Kamala Harris, who has spent decades of her career fighting to improve the lives of mothers and children in our country. As District Attorney of San Francisco, Vice President Harris worked to create the Center for Youth Wellness focused specifically on childhood trauma. And as Attorney General of California, she opened the first ever Bureau of Children's Justice, which focused exclusively on protecting the rights of children. Over the last several years as Senator, Vice President Harris brought the issue of maternal health and most importantly, the issue of women dying during childbirth to our nation's forefront. As Senator, she introduced the Maternal Care Act, the Uterine Fibroids Research and Education Act, and the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. This is now a key component of the Biden-Harris agenda and the Build Back Better Act. In conjunction with President Biden, she is leading this call to action today to improve the state of our maternal health care. Thank you, Vice President Harris. 
We will also hear from Allison Felix. Allison is an American track and field champion and icon. She's the most decorated American track and field athlete in Olympic history, having earned 11 total medals from five consecutive games, including seven gold medals. She's been featured in Time 100's most influential people list for two years in a row and previously served on the Obama Biden Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition for over six years. She has spent her career advocating for mothers around the world on everything from maternal health care to job protections for pregnant women. We are so thankful to have her join us at the White House today. And so without further ado, here is Vice President Kamala Harris and Allison Felix. Thank you, Rohini. It's so good to be with you again. Uh, we were talking backstage <laughs> the last time we were together. It was at the very beginning of COVID, and yes. we tried to do an Instagram <laughs> Live, and uh, I couldn't figure out how to work it. <laughs> we were all trying to figure it out. <laughs> but um, And so some time has passed, but your leadership on this issue has remained constant. Mm -hmm. And in addition to all that you have achieved in terms of your excellence, and, and how you inspire so many. Um, you have been an extraordinary advocate on this issue, and I want to thank you because you really do inspire me and so many people around our country. And so your daughter, Cameron, is now three. Yes. <laughs> Will you talk a little bit about the experience you had during your pregnancy and childbirth that led you to, to really use your voice in such a courageous way on this issue. Yeah, well, thank you so much. That means so much to me. Um, and I'm just so grateful for all the work that you have always done um, on this topic. Yes, my daughter just turned three. Um, but I, when I became pregnant, you know, as an athlete, my health is something that I'm always thinking about. Right. And I've always lived a really healthy lifestyle. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't even almost think twice about, you know, getting through my pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And at 32 weeks, I went into the doctor for a routine appointment. And right away, um, there were some concerning things that were happening. You know, I was spilling protein. Um, my blood pressure was up. And mm -hmm. so I was sent to the hospital for further monitoring. Once I got there, things started to rapidly um, kind of shift out of control. Mm -hmm. And I was diagnosed with a severe case of preeclampsia. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of went downhill from there. I ended up having an emergency C-section and my daughter was born two months early. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that I was able to, you know, eventually walk out of the hospital. And even though my daughter, you know, spent time fighting for her own life yeah. in the NICU, we all walked out together. And, you know, as we know, there are so many women who that's not the story. And so my eyes were opened. And now, you know, it's a passion on my heart to just do more work in this area and raise awareness um, to what is happening. So on that point, you, in addition, again, to your professional excellence as an athlete, you served six years during the Obama-Biden administration as an advocate for health and wellness and fitness. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you really were, again, such an important advocate on the issues that relate to those areas. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the work you have been doing as an advocate on this issue of maternal health and, and what we need to do as a nation to be better on this issue? Yeah, well, I'm so happy that, you know, today is happening and that, you know, funds have been committed to this area. Um, I've been, you know, raising awareness. I partnered mm -hmm. with March of Dimes, who's been mm -hmm. doing important work for so long in this space. Mm -hmm. And I feel like really sharing those stories. I remember my time in the hospital and just mm -hmm. feeling like I didn't, I wasn't prepared for this. You know, yeah. I didn't know what to expect. And hearing, you know, what other people went through and that hope that they gave me yeah. was huge. But I think also sharing those stories lets women, and especially women of color, know that yeah. they are at risk and what they can do um, to prepare themselves. So, Allison, t let, take us through those moments when you are in those rooms talking mm -hmm. with these incredible women. What are those conversations and what do they share with you that the nation needs to know yeah. to fully understand and, and care about this issue? Can you share with us and share with the nation what, what folks need to understand about this? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that really touched my heart was this is not an issue that, you know, it doesn't discriminate, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm, I had great health care, you know, mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate and very blessed. 
um, but I still found myself in this situation. Hearing from other women that their pain wasn't believed, you know, yeah. that they had concerns that weren't heard. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so unfortunate. Um, what's really shocking is that 60% of these comp 60 of this number, you know, can be preventable. Right. Um, and that's huge, but it also, you know, that's the exciting part that we can turn this around. And so when we think about th this, which is we are, we are taking this to the highest ground possible, which is having this conversation on the stage in the White House. Yes. Let's talk about what the future can look like and what that would mean for, for women around America. And we've talked about black maternal mortality and that black women are three times mm -hmm. more likely than other women to, to die from mm -hmm. childbirth. Uh, Native women, twice as likely. Yeah. Women in rural America, 60% more likely to have complications because of uh, what we call the, the, the deserts, mm -hmm. the, the unavailability of appropriate maternal care. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what the world can look like and yeah. what the solutions look like. Yeah, I think that a day where you're not at risk, you know, when you become pregnant, that you are not fearful. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about a, a segment pre pregnancy for myself and yeah. what that might look like um, and being able to reverse some of these issues or going into a doctor's office and not having to be intimidated to, to raise concerns and yeah. knowing that right away, if, if yeah. I have an issue, that I can be heard as well. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, the maternal deserts and um, having that high quality yeah. care for all women, regardless of your, you know, the status of your insurance or where you're at, um, that we can all have access to that. You know, backstage, you and I were talking about the importance of everyone knowing they're not alone. Yes. And for so many women, going through this what should be joyous and beautiful process mm -hmm. can also mean feeling alone. And and in particular, when women are in that 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 setting where they're talking with a physician or talking with a healthcare provider yeah. and and feeling that they're not being heard or being reluctant to share how they are actually feeling. Mm -hmm. And there's so much about the work that you have done that is reminding women they are not alone, mm -hmm. that this is a story that, that sadly is a story that many women have in common. And therefore the need for women that when they're in that room, to not feel alone yes. and to know their power and that it is the responsibility of that healthcare professional yes. to hear it, mm -hmm. to listen to it, and to act on it. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how you have talked with women about owning and, and requiring the, the, the system to yeah. own its responsibility to these women. Yeah, I mean, absolutely what you said, that it is their responsibility. Yeah. And until those systems are in place the way that they should be, you know, it does fall on women to mm -hmm. advocate for themselves or our partners to be there right. in the room to do so. I remember when I was in that uh, the hospital and being terrified of what was happening. I didn't even understand really what preeclampsia was. And, you know, I was really grateful that my partner was able to advocate mm -hmm. on my behalf. You know, yeah. when things went south and I wasn't able to make the decisions on behalf of our family, that he could step up and do mm -hmm. that. And so um, I, I want that for all women and I want us mm -hmm. to, you know, for things to just be different and not to be in a situation that is so terrifying and traumatic. And a large part of our work is on maternal systems in terms of the delivery of care mm -hmm. for women um, during pregnancy and childbirth. But let's also talk about the need for us to, to stay connected with these women, with their partners, yes. with the parents of the child who is now with us in terms of issues like child care yes. and affordable child care, um, elder care. I've met so many around the country, mothers and fathers who are raising young children mm. um, from infancy on yeah. and also taking care of senior relatives and the need therefore to have care and assistance with caring for their children and their senior relatives. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about the importance of a nation. Yeah. Yeah. Supporting parents. It's so important. I know my own experience when I decided to start a family and 
not being supported ultimately by my former sponsor and just what that looked like and mm. how it made me feel that I wasn't valued and so many women who came before me who struggled and weren't mm -hmm. celebrated. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's so important. I work to get child grants along with Athleta and Women's Sports Foundation mm -hmm. to be able to support these women. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think you should have to choose between your profession and having a family, you know, to be able to do both and be able to do both very well. And so I'll continue to push forward on those efforts because it does, um, it is necessary and mm -hmm. I think that we can do more. Well, and, and people may not know, but you really do walk your talk in every way because I happen to know how you have supported athletes mm -hmm. who are moms who might need some help taking care of childcare. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, creating grants, you know, to support women who are competing at the highest level mm -hmm. um, and having to deal with childcare. I just remember when I came back, I started competing when my daughter was eight months. Yeah. And it was so hard to be able to travel and to have a newborn and mm -hmm. to deal with all of these logistics and things that people didn't really think about how it would mm -hmm. come together and so I felt like this would be a great way to support you know women as they continue mm -hmm. to go on with their careers and to say that you can still have your best performances um, after you have a family and I'm talking you know my sport is running but this is you know in all industries you know right. women feel this and so mm -hmm. I think um, this is a way you know I felt like I could do something um, but obviously much more to, to do. So when we think about, to your point, women in the workforce, mm -hmm. right? Because we need to support all moms, all parents. Yeah. Um, but when we think about the unique challenges about women in the workforce, let's talk about that in the context also of, of what we're doing with Build Back Better, which, which has passed out of the House of Representatives. We yeah. expect that the Senate will pass it. But it, it is about also saying that parents should not have to spend more than 7% of their mm. income in child care. Mm. Because yeah. with the demands, right, with the financial demands of parenting and living, yes. um, it, it should not be impossible for a working parent to have that kind of support. Can you talk a little bit about the experience that you've had and, and the parents you've talked with who need this kind of assistance? Yeah, it's really been just amazing to see the individuals, you know, who do need the support and hear their stories, you know, mm -hmm. of what their days are like and what the struggles look like, mm -hmm. you know, that every day person who is trying to make it. Um, and to your point that that's so necessary, so needed and has such an impact um, on their lives and for them to be able to, you know, to continue making their livelihood. So as we close out this conversation, let's think about the basic points that we want policymakers at the local level, at the statewide level, and of course we have so many leaders, we had so many of them on the stage, yeah. the, the Congress members. Um, what do we want them to think about in terms of the experience in a way that dictates what they prioritize for public policy? So starting with the issue of, of for example, one of my bills when I was in the Senate saying let's deal with training mm -hmm. healthcare professionals. Yes including let's let us honor the work of doulas yes. and midwives mm -hmm. and understand how they can actually teach yes. others in the healthcare delivery system including doctors mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot that they know that actually can be shared in a way that enhances the experience that women Absolutely. going through the process have. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. I think that training is absolutely key. Yeah. Um, when you speak about doulas and just their impact in the community and yeah. how they can communicate some of these complex um, situations yeah. to people and the trust that you have. And yeah. so I think that that's huge to be able to prepare people. And I think about you know my own experience and going to the doctor and um, not being told that I was at risk, not having yeah. that preparation or even having my mind go to a place mm -hmm. where this is something that I should be thinking about mm -hmm. and how can I prepare and plan for if mm -hmm. things don't go exactly right. So thinking about that experience of, um, of women as they go and interact with their doctors mm -hmm. and um, right from that initial moment, you know, how their care will be given to them um, and to your point of the training and the doula and um, really addressing that implicit bias that we've seen uh, for so long. And on that issue, because we know that um, for so many women, it, the way, the disparity in terms of how they're treated, right? I mean, first of all, let's say that there is a lot in the healthcare system that actually helps and can help all women. Yes. But 
the way that that is administered mm -hmm. can be the issue on whether all women are treated equally. Yeah. So it is, it, it, sometimes it's about are the resources in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. But on this issue, we also know that it is also about how the resources are used mm -hmm. and, and, and who receives those resources. And so it is important to teach about the biases that may inform the diagnosis and the treatment. Yeah. Um, but also let's, you know, let's think about women in rural America. Mm -hmm. And it's also about the lack of availability. Yeah. So much of what we are talking about in terms of the Build Back Better approach is to say, we need to have resources in rural America yeah. to assist these mothers and their partners and their husbands mm -hmm. um, to get the resources they need to get mobile units out mm -hmm. there so that they can receive the same kind of treatment. How do you think about that? Yeah, I think those resources are so important because a lot of these issues where we're seeing women face death are happening postpartum. Yeah. And when you talk about these rural areas, they do not have access if mm -hmm. there is an issue. Then having a plan to get back to you know, a hospital that is yeah. equipped to deal with these issues is a whole nother concern. So it's not only, you know, mm -hmm. through the pregnancy, but it's afterwards. And really hearing, you know, the issues. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we run into problems because women are bringing up that something feels wrong afterwards. Yeah, that's right. And it's right. being dismissed. And so, yes, the rural areas, you know, having that access and those resources is huge. And for all mm -hmm. women postpartum, really focusing mm -hmm. on, you know, hearing when there is an issue. That's right. And, and that's the point also, which I, I really appreciate you stressing, which is we are talking about supporting mothers to mother. Yeah. Yeah. And that's about from, it, it is from the pregnancy mm -hmm. through childbirth and then all that comes after. One of the things I'm particularly excited about is that what we will do is extend support um, through Medicaid to mm -hmm. say that postpartum support should not just be 60 days after yeah. childbirth. That's not going to deal not with enough. what we need to actually address. Let's do it for a year. Yeah. And it's about everything from exams to what a, a, a mother often may need mm -hmm. in terms of postpartum depression and what we need to do around treating the whole body, which includes from the neck up, and that's mm -hmm. about addressing any health issues that she needs in terms of mental health support, so critically important. I'm so excited about that as well yeah. because I've, I've heard far too many heartbreaking stories yeah. of losing mothers, mothers who aren't able to mother their children, um, mm -hmm. things that were preventable. Yeah. And that time is crucial. So I think that's gonna have such an impact to be able to have that year long um, and really to be able to address those issues. That's, uh, you, losing mothers was yeah. the phrase you used. We cannot be a society that is losing mothers. Yeah. And it's so preventable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And part of it is, is, is being clear that we're not going to let them feel alone. Mm -hmm. We're not going to let them be alone. And they're too precious. Yeah. You know, I gave a speech earlier, and when you support mothers, you support children, you support the future of our country. Yeah. It's just that basic. Yeah. It's so important, and um, I think immediately, you know, we'll feel the impact of that and see the lives change, and, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's so important. Thank you, Allison. Thank it's you good so to much. be with you. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. I'm grateful to be here with you all today with champions of maternal health and health equity within the administration and on the Hill and so many incredible leaders from across the US as we further commit to the work needed to address our country's maternal mortality and morbidity crisis. The White House Gender Policy Council has worked alongside colleagues across the government on this key administration priority. And we look forward to continuing this work in partnership with the Vice President Secretary Becerra, CMS Administrator Chiquita brooks Lashore, Susan Rice at the Domestic Policy Council, and many others. This first ever White House Maternal Health Day of Action calls upon both the public and private sectors to improve health outcomes for parents and infants in the United States. It also calls upon men 
To jumpstart this critical discussion, I look forward to the upcoming panel on the role of men, which includes champions who have advocated and acted to improve maternal health and to encourage other men to step up as well. This panel underscores that the maternal health crisis we face impacts entire families, communities, and our country as a whole, and demands that we all take action. Hi, it's uh, Cory Booker, and I'm really pleased to be here. This day is extraordinary and historic. Uh, I'm honored that Vice President Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have centered uh, this issue of awareness and action around maternal health, uh, not only in policy in general, but really uh, through executive action and through what I believe will be one of the greatest pieces of legislation in American history to build back better uh, uh, policies, to build back better bill. And so I know this has been mentioned uh, throughout the summit, but I wanna reemphasize it here on this particular panel, that we are the wealthiest nation in the world, but have the shameful distinction of having the highest maternal mortality rates amongst wealthy nations. The majority of those deaths are preventable. And more than that, we see amidst these healthcare disparities uh, that make it even worse for uh, women of color. Uh, with two to three times higher rates of black and brown women dying uh, than majority women. And so this is a shameful reality. Uh, it is a national shame. Uh, but uh, as was said by a previous president, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be solved with what's right with America. And I'm grateful, again, that there are congressional leaders and others who are rolling up the sleeves, their sleeves to do something about this. In my entire career in the Senate, this has been uh, one of my focuses. And I'm very proud that a lot of the policies I've worked on with Kamala Harris when she was then Senator Harris, as well as some great House members like Lauren Underwood, Alma Adams, Ayanna Presley, that we put together some really great bills like the Mommies Act, uh, which would expand, extend postpartum Medicaid coverage uh, from just 60 days to an entire year uh, from other issues like the help, uh, Maternal Health Momnibus Act, uh, which is a comprehensive maternal health legislation, uh, again, championed by vi the vice president, uh, that these two bills and components of it are really close uh, to being law in the Build Back Better plan. And so now you might be asking yourself that uh, why is a male senator uh, talking about these issues? Mm -hmm. uh, why has it been center at the center of my policy agenda since I came to the United States Senate? Well, I'll be very clear. Uh, this is not an issue uh, just for women. This is an issue for all of us. Uh, if we believe in the fundamental ideals of this nation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if we believe that uh, the health of our children and mothers are sacrosanct to our ideas uh, of a successful nation, then we all have to be concerned about these issues. And so I believe uh, that we all have to be champions, along with doulas and midwives, community workers, activists, healthcare professionals, uh, because when it comes to all of our success, uh, our children and birthing people have to be at the center. And so I'm grateful uh, that today we have in this panel uh, two individuals who have a tremendous testimony, who share with me this core purpose, and in many ways have turned their own personal pain uh, into a life purpose. Uh, I'd like to introduce and thank our panelists specifically now uh, for joining us in this discussion. And they're Charles Johnson and Alexis Ohanian. Um, and I wanna say, Charles, uh, I would really like it if you could introduce yourself and maybe share your uh, really compelling testimony with folks that are watching. Sure, absolutely. Senator Booker, first and foremost, let me just thank you um, because you know, I was really just had a heavy heart this morning, just thinking about this journey that I've been in on this advocacy road for almost five years. And far before um, the issue of maternal wellness and maternal health had hit the mainstream, you have been a champion out here. I remember coming to Congress in 2017 when I first started advocating, and nobody would even take meetings with me. But your staff, uh, welcome us with open arms. You were championing legislation even back then. But to be here standing arm in arm with you on the verge of this unprecedented legislation that is going to change and impact not only mothers today, but far after we're gone, I'm extremely grateful. So um, I know it was a mouthful, but it was important. It was important. So uh, I'm Charles Johnson. I'm the founder of Four Cure for Moms, which is a 
organization committed to ending the maternal mortality crisis. But um, how I ended up here was I was fortunate enough, um, you know, Alexis and Senator Booker to meet a woman that absolutely changed my life, right? And so when we talk about my wife, Kira, we're talking about a woman that spoke five languages fluently, that raced cars that was a skydiver. And, you know, honestly, she was, truth be told, way out of my league, right? And um, I always wanted to be a dad. And so we welcomed our first son in 2014. We always talked about how cool it would be to have back-to-back -back boys, right? And we found that we welcomed our second son in 2016. We were over the moon. And so on April 12th of 2016, um, we walked into Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, California, where we expected to be the happiest day of our lives, and we walked straight into a nightmare. Um, and I know, Alexis, you can relate, right, that anticipation of being a father, right, especially for the first time, right? It's this amazing, this overwhelming joy, but a little bit anxious. And so our son was born perfectly healthy, um, and they took us back to recovery, and that's when things took a turn for the worse. And as Kira's sitting there resting and our new baby is sitting there resting. I look down by Kira's bedside and I begin to see blood coming from her catheter, her Foley catheter. And I brought it to the attention of the doctors and the nurses at Cedars. Um, and they came in and they examined Kira. And this is around four o'clock in the, in the afternoon. And um, they ordered a series of tests. Um, in the interest of time, I know I want to get to what I know is going to be an incredibly robust discussion, but what happened over the next 12 hours is Kira was allowed to bleed internally while myself, my family begged and pleaded for them to take action, begged and pleaded for them to go take her for a CT scan that they said they would take, that they ordered at five o'clock. Five o'clock came, six o'clock came, seven o'clock came. They didn't take her back to surgery until after midnight. And that CT scan never took place. And by the time they took her back to surgery and they opened her up, there were three liters of blood in her abdomen for which she'd been allowed to bleed and suffer needlessly while my family and myself begged for them to simply just hear her concerns. Um, and so that afternoon, we walked into Cedar Sinai Hospital. The thought that my wife would not walk out to raise her boys, it never crossed my mind. Um, but as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, I began to hear stories of other women with horrific birthing experiences and other women that were losing their lives. And I began to think to myself, something just isn't right. And that's when I began to do the research myself. And I came to understand what we all know here today is that we are in the midst of a maternal mortality crisis, as you said, that's shameful, not only domestically, but it's shameful globally. And so for the past four and a half years, I've committed my life to doing everything I can, although there's nothing we can do to bring Kira back. Um, I owe it to her, I owe it to my boys, I owe it to all the other mothers that have lost their lives, um, giving the ultimate gift of birth to everything we can to make sure we send other mothers home with their precious babies. I mean, Charles, th that, that story is painful uh, to hear. And the, 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 the beauty that is coming out of it is that Kira was a Kira's great woman and her legacy of love lives on through you and her sons. Thank and you so much. Yeah, to take your pain and turn it into purpose is something that to me is just extraordinary. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really grateful for you, Alexis. Will you introduce yourself, man, and and uh, uh, tell tell your story as well? Sure. Well, look, it uh, again. Thank you for convening this. Um, I feel like I got a window uh, into something. Uh, that I never would have otherwise gotten. Uh, most people know me for creating Reddit. Uh, I run a venture capital firm now called 776. But um, this became a very personal issue because my wife, who um, is yeah, Serena Williams, uh, you would expect, you know, with all the, the access we have, um, with all the advantages we have would be getting, you know, best in class care. And, and the, the glimpse I got in, especially as a, as a white dude who, <laughs> you know, every, everyone listens to who always gets the, the benefit of the doubt in any situation who, who's had a, a ton of privilege, basically everywhere I go, I got a window window into something that um, absolutely affected me and, and has made this such an important issue for me ever since. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty well documented. But when uh, Serena went in to give birth to our daughter, Olympia, birth went fine. And then sure enough, afterwards, um, she has a history of pulmonary embolisms and um, ended up having 
uh, a couple there in the hospital, some emergency surgeries. And, and, and really, the, the punchline here is she had to diagnose herself. Right. And she had to say to the doctors, this, like, specifically the drugs, these are the drugs I need, this is, this is what I need right now. And as a husband, in that moment, you want to do everything you can for your wife. And it is a surreal feeling to be in these situations and not be able to get people to listen, not be able to get people to act, even when you're sitting here as someone who, you know, you're very used to having people listen to you. Um, and you're with a woman who, you know, is, is a superhero. Um, to, to see how close she was, in spite of all the advantages we have, um, to see how close she was to, to, to passing, it was uh, a humbling and a grounding experience. And, and it, was, it was only after she shared her story publicly that we started to educate ourselves and learn you know, a lot about all this great work Charles has been doing and, and others to, to raise awareness on this issue. There is a, a shameful uh, Black maternal health crisis in particular in this country that uh, that we, we need to do so much better on. And it's part of the reason I've become such an advocate for paid family leave as well, because yes. I don't want any American man or woman to have to decide between being in the NICU or the ICU and their job, right? That no man, no person should have to make that decision, man or woman ever between their family during these precious moments in their career. So just grateful to be here. Um, I know I'm going to learn a lot too. And uh, well, you, you say that humbly because uh, we all know your platform, and you use it really to educate folks on on a few things. Number one, maternal mor mor morbidity, or what we might also call near misses, even as mm. was in your case. Mm. This is serious. It's affecting fifty thousand to sixty thousand uh, uh, pregnant people a year. So this is not something that is uh, uh, an anomaly. This is happening to tens of thousands of families going through what you went through. And then the epidemic of women not being believed and listened to right. um, is just stunning. And we find that often across, uh, especially for black women, across uh, educational spectrums mm -hmm. to economic spectrums, it is a real issue. And then uh, the, the finally, the, the importance of paid family leave, which you've really become such a loud voice, it is, it is a connected part of what's going on. As we know, a lot of these complications don't occur in the immediate aftermath, as it did with the two of you, uh, two of your your uh, spouses, but often a month later, two months later, three mm -hmm. months later, or more. So, so I just I'm grateful for using your 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 platform as you do and being unapologetic about advancing a cause that doesn't have a partisan tinge to it. It's about our it's about birthing people. It's about women. It's about our healthy children. And hey, yeah. Charles, I think there's a dynamic of this that we don't talk about enough, sure. which is what is the impact of not just we center ourselves on Kira and the women that we've lost, but we don't take that next step of empathy to understand what this does to a family uh, in terms of uh, uh, child care and raising children and the trauma that often follows with that and how that, that, that trauma doesn't, isn't just something that you feel and then it's gone. It often lives with, with children and, and, and families. I'm wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit about um, what government and other stakeholders can be doing really to support families and what's really going on with families that suffer this kind of loss. No, absolutely. And I, I thank you so much for just bringing that up because that is something that often is overlooked. Um, and one thing there's, you know, as I, you know, am on this journey, there's so many things I'm still trying to figure out. But one of the things I'm crystal clear about, Senator Booker, is that nothing can replace a mother, nothing. And that's one of the things, you know, we see the, you know, we hear about the data, we hear about the statistics, but like I've said, oftentimes there's no statistic that can quantify what it's like to tell an 18 month old that his mother's never coming home, right? There's no like point in your algorithm that can try and quantify, you know, trying to explain to a son that will never know their mother just how amazing she was. And I was talking to a friend last night who reached out to me and he said, uh, you know, Charles, don't hold anything back. And in that spirit, I'll share with everybody here today. And even just last night, you know, my boys are now um, five and seven years old. These are my guys right there. They're new five and seven. All right. And um, 
they're just amazing little dudes, right? And I'm so blessed. They're smart and they're thriving, but still, there are moments. And literally, just last night after dinner, as we're sitting there, um, just preparing to get ready to go to bed, my youngest son Langston asked me, he said, Daddy, where's mommy? And I kind of just, you kind of take one of those, because there's a conversation that we've had. And I explained to him again that, you know, mommy is in heaven. You know, she's an angel and she's doing important work. And he says, well, but she's supposed to come home after 60 days. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, they told me that she's supposed to come back. The people who are in the sky are supposed to come back after 60 days. And I said, well, who said that? And he said, that's what they told me. And now at this point, it doesn't matter where he heard that or how he rationalized that, or if he got it from YouTube or he heard it from friends at school. I'm sitting here face to face with a five-year-old who has somehow latched on to some hope or possibility that his mother's gonna walk through that door. And I have to disappoint him all over again and explain to him that that's not gonna happen. And so these impacts of these mothers, all these mothers that we are losing are precious gifts and so critical to these communities. And so I think that it's important that as a nation that we are supporting not only immediate family, but the, the extended family with the resources they need, helping them with childcare. I'm fortunate that I have a tremendous extended family that's rallied around me. But what if you're like some friends that I know that have lost their wives that have their hourly workers, their hourly construction workers, and have to make that choice between caring for that precious child and going to work, making sure that they have the grief, the grief counseling support necessary to make sure that they recover and that they have the tools that they need to get their life back on track. Um, I think that those are all things that we can do to make sure that we're supporting these families. Yeah, I, I tell you, you, it's just hard not to get emotional when you're talking about that because I'm immediately thinking about the role my mom played. You know, she was there for taking me to school, uh, packing lunches, teacher visits, all, all of those things. Plus, she was a, a co-earner with my dad, right? And who had a different kind of job that took him away a lot more, so he couldn't do a lot of those domestic things. And then I also think about those single moms who go to the hospital and know they're going to be raising these kids alone, and then they die. And what 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 kind of where do those children fall in terms of a family support network? So, this is this is real, and it's um, and it's uh, it's difficult, and and that's why the silence about this issue has allowed it to become such a major problem in America. And Alexis, you you are doing such a profound job confronting the silence, bringing these issues to the fore. And um, I I think technology is. I've always said this. I was an early adapter uh, on a lot of social media. It's like a mountain range. You know, there are peaks, towering peaks of possibility with technology. There are definitely valleys we all know about. But I'm wondering you as a tech person who's trying to use technology uh, to show the future, to be a democratizing force, a force of awareness, a force to create community. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering when it comes to the tech industry, what, what can be they be doing uh, to really focus on maternal health and eliminating these disparities in maternal health. Well, look, and I, I do, I want to stress as much as I believe in technology and entrepreneurship to help make this better government absolutely does have a role to play. So I, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. Um, I do, I do think fem tech that is technology around women and particularly women's health is a huge, huge opportunity. It's just starting to get the investment it deserves. And I think over the next 10 years, our fund in particular is going to be investing literally millions, tens of millions of dollars into these types of companies, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because I actually think there's a lot of amazing entrepreneurs who are going to build very successful businesses out of them. Um, and, and what's interesting and, and probably a little sad is more often than not, you have women and, and in particular women of color who because they've gotten so frustrated with the inadequacies of our uh, system that have gone out and said, okay, I'm just gonna build something better. Um, and this was the case of one CEO we backed uh, named Simone Tate who said, I'm gonna build, it's called Poppy Seed Health. Because of my own birthing experience, I'm gonna build a platform for 24 seven text-based support 
um, so that any any woman can get access to a, a doula, midwife, nurse, basically on demand for all the things they need as soon as they realize they're pregnant all the way through uh, birth and then beyond. And And I do think in the best case scenario, you're going to have entrepreneurs who out of necessity will build better systems that are going to create equitable solutions to help give more women access to resources they wouldn't otherwise have. Because software can do that. Technology can democratize access, can make things much cheaper and more accessible. Um, and, and I do think has an important role to play. Uh, the, the, the challenge, though, is going to be, you know, these solutions can't come fast enough. And these are solutions that are still in their infancy. I think, I think in 10 years, this sector is going to look very obvious. It is going to have uh, it's going to employ a lot of people. It's going to generate a, a lot of great value and wealth, but uh, you know we don't have that kind of time. And and the sooner we get solutions that are actually helping uh, American women, the better. Amen. Amen. Charles, you are. Uh, I I look at you also as like this foot soldier of the movement. You know, there there are people who were beaten down, suffered tragedy from Mamie Till and another movement. Uh, good families of Goodman, Chain, Schwarners, people who suffered awful tragedy, but turned their tragedy uh, towards triumph, towards obtaining triumph. And I, I love this uh, that you, uh, through your work, um, that there are like important pieces that are really have been at the center of your advocacy, including uh, the Kira Johnson Act. And I was wondering if you can uh, talk to us about the Kira Johnson Act and why it in particular is significant. Yeah, I, um, I'm just so grateful to be working in partnership with all of you all, and in particular, um, you know, the entire Black Maternal Health Caucus. And I just remember getting the call from Representative Warren Underwood that they wanted to name a bill after Kira. And it was just, um, it's such a tremendous honor and just an, uh, a wonderful way to uphold her legacy. But the, this, this act in particular is something that we're really proud of. It's going to do several things that are really important. It's going to award funding to community-based um, women-led organizations of color, which really speaks to directly what Alexis was saying. So we're going to be funding community-based organizations that are on the front line, supporting families, catching the babies who really historically haven't had access, so many of them, to federal funding to give them the resources they need to better serve families. Um, it's going to take important steps to diversify the perinatal workforce, right? Um, and then we're gonna take very, very critical steps towards better patient accountability and transparency by providing, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create um, what are called um, dignified standard of care compliance offices that are gonna be within hospitals yet independent of hospitals. So if you're in an instance like um, Alexis and his family, or other families so who are so often found in situations where they are faced with challenges and they have instances where they feel neglected, where they feel discriminated against, where they feel like their um, cries for help aren't answered, they're going to have a place to report those instances within that hospital that's going to be independent from that hospital. And then the federal government will have an opportunity to publish that data. So it's going to take Amen. important steps towards accountability and transparency, and we're really proud of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of it too, man, because I felt like we were in the wilderness like four or five years ago with yeah. not seeing a pathway to getting this done. Now we're, you know, we're on the goal line and what you're outlining, are, it will make a real difference. I, I still find it, uh, Alexis, just like when I read your testimony about Serena literally getting up out of bed and, and demanding the specific name of the drug. I mean, that story was powerful. And then when they finally gave her the CT as she was insisting that she got, um, and, and so this is like, this is vindication. Some of this that you, that we all together have been able to get help get done. But Alexis, there, there, there is that issue we've already touched on that. I just want to push back on you because it, it's almost like stunning. I mean, just, if you're living in Montana, in Detroit, just like a mile up in Canada, women up there have mm -hmm. a long family leave, but if you're a single mom, you know, and who's just given birth and having pain and 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 complications, you're being forced back into the workplace at a time that could really risk your health. Where, or not to mention if you have a prenatal birth and a, of a child, complications. Right. Not to mention that even if it's just a a a a, a, a childbirth without complication, this mm -hmm. idea that we wouldn't give that kind of fundamental time of bonding uh, at the beginning of a child's life. And so you've written about this. You've spoken out about this. You did a powerful editorial about this. 
I'm wondering if you can uh, spike the football on this point for us uh, a little bit and just drive home why you're outraged uh, and and what the key drivers to your thought process are. You know, the word that comes to mind is barbaric. And, and the statistic that makes me feel that way is the one that today in America, one in four women will be back to work two weeks after giving birth. And consider that some number of those women had complications, had even C-sections. C-sections are a real surgery, right? I, uh, most of uh, the, 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 the parental duties after Olympia was born around our house because of the C-section and other surgeries Serena had fell on my shoulders. I, I can't imagine the women who don't have anywhere close to the resources that we had having to endure that. And so, yeah, it's barbaric to think that in the United States, one in four women are back to work in two weeks after giving birth. That alone should make every American, even the senators in West Virginia, mm -hmm. sit up and think, not in my country, right? If you actually care about American families, that should not, that should not happen, full stop. And, and I, I think, you know, this, this paid family live issue is one that I candidly didn't even think about as I know, look, this is often the case uh, until it affected me. Wow. And, and it was something we offered at our company um, because our head of people and culture, uh, the amazing woman, Caitlin Holloway, said, hey, look, if you want to attract and retain the best talent, you need to have this. And I thought about it as a business decision. Of course. Okay, great. We want the best talent. We, they, that's what they demand. Great. They're going to have it. And then it was after, you know, Olympia was due that I realized, all right, let me take advantage of it. Let me set an example for other men in the organization. Um, because I do think it's important that, that if we de-risk uh, this idea, you know, there are so many men who are too afraid to even take advantage of it. If they're lucky enough to even have access that we need to change the culture around that. Um, and, and I think it has a ripple effect. Uh, it, is, it is clear that offering this time isn't just good for building the family unit, isn't just good for you know, being decent uh, and not having to force someone to choose between their family and their, and their job. Um, but we know it leads to better health outcomes for the child, for the mother. It, it, is, it is absolutely long overdue. And, and the, the thing I also just need to touch on too is, um, I, the the things like the Kerry Johnson Act play such an important role because we are trying to unwind a system that, again, for someone who looks like me, I I have blind spots to this, and it's it's only through the relationship I've had really now with with my life my wife for the last four or five years that I start to really see it, and 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 this is not to say. These are nurses or doctors who are themselves racist per se. It's not. It's not that these are these are these are people trying to do spiteful wrong things, but these are systems that are fundamentally flawed and have been broken for a very long time. And it is just so crucial, especially at a time that is so vulnerable for so many people. We 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 should absolutely find space to want better outcomes for for newborn children and their families like if we can't all agree that this is an issue that we should all be fighting for that should be bipartisan i i i, I, just, I can't even fathom that because this is the, the sort of most basic fundamental human thing right right this is creating new life and and bringing it in this world and and trying to undo even just a fraction of the inequity that exists in our society um, to, to give a, a, a newborn a shot and their family a shot. So I, this stuff is all interconnected. And I do think the tide is going to turn and, and whether or not a, a senator from West Virginia wants his legacy to be stopping something this obvious and this important, we'll see. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm still optimistic. I, I know it's not a question of if, it's a question of when we'll get paid family leave for all Americans. Uh, just would like it to be as soon as possible. Hallelujah. So, so look, you guys, um, you spiked the football, by the way, and uh, and did some did Absolutely. some finger pointing too, which was which was uh, very very uh, NFL like of you. Yeah. Let me yeah, wrap man. up, fellas. Look, <laughs> we, the two of you have, uh, in my opinion, uh, been important in this national conversation because you force fellas, you force guys to understand this is not a women's issue. This is our issue. You also have been using your own gifts to to explode this further into the national conversation. And so I want to say thank you both. I also want to say God bless Joe Biden. God bless Kamala Harris. Uh, this is why we elected them, not to do what is the political flavor of the moment, but to, 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 to change lives, 
uh, to elevate life, to save lives. And you said this is a, a bipartisan issue. It's a nonpartisan issue, actually. This is just mm. about people. Well, this, yeah. Politics should not be, we as a society should end this shameful reality, and we are close to doing it, I think, with the legislation we put in place on the federal level. States like mine, New Jersey, God bless Bill Murphy, are jumping way ahead in this space as well and getting real things done. There is a movement going on. You two are foot soldiers on that movement. I want to thank you. I want to wrap up just by saying, uh, again, thank you, Kamala Harris, for showing the truth on this in the, in the, in the Senate and for leading in on the White House. We're going to get this done together. We as a community, we as a country are going to rise on up. Oh, Absolutely. wait a minute. I was getting a signal. You got that, the signal? Uh, that I was getting a signal. But I, you know, I was getting the plays call from the sideline, okay. telling the guy on the field. Um, I, I wonder if I got a few more. Do I have a few more minutes? Can I buy a minute or two? Hmm. Just a minute. So I'm going to give up my minute. I'm going to let you two have the final word. Alexis, 30 seconds, and then Charles, 30 seconds. I'd love to know uh, uh, any, any particularized message for men who, who again, don't, might not see this as an issue. Hmm. All right. I, I want to make sure that, Charles, you get the last word. So I, I will say, at the very least, you probably have a woman in your life who you care about. I really hope so. If you don't, I feel very sorry for you. But at the very least, consider them and consider them in their most vulnerable and, and consider them at a moment when they should be at their happiest and and want to do right by them by supporting maternal health. And 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 even if somehow you lack any kind of empathy, there is still a much better society in store for us uh, as long as we protect uh, women and, and the, the health of moms. Um, it is a more productive society. It is a more successful economically society. Um, there are lots of reasons, even if you lack all empathy to want to support this. Uh, but fortunately, I think most of the people listening actually do care. And, yeah. and this is something that we have every right to, to fight for just as loudly, even though it doesn't affect us. Um, we, we should care just as much, if not more, because chances are yeah. you, you had a mama. And, yeah. and you should at least do right and honor her. Amen. Charles, yeah. take us home, man. Let's take it home. So uh, I, I'm going to pick up where Alexis dropped off. And that's right, you have a mom, man. Like, we talk about this being a nonpartisan issue. There's two types of people in our country. Either you are a mama or you got one, right? Then beyond that, I think that when we talk about the role of men in being able to talk about this crisis in a historical context, two things come to mind. It's one... It is um, advocacy. So making sure that you are tapping into resources so that you can make sure that you are informed and you are empowered to make sure that your partner, whoever it is that you care about, whether it's your sister, comes and is able to thrive before, during, and after childbirth. So to make sure that you understand you know, how to support them, what post-birth warning signs are, what signs of post postpartum depression are. All those resources sources are readily available. You can tap in with us at 4 momscom There's wonderful organizations out there. And then the next thing that I have to say that's critically important is responsible allyship, right? And so we have to, as men, um, use our privilege and our voice to not dominate this conversation, but to lift up and amplify the amazing work of women that are doing this. Um, and so I have to give deference to the women that were doing this work before I even knew there was a problem, right? All the doulas on the front line, all the birth workers, all the OBs, all the policy workers that have been working and screaming from the mountaintops that we have a problem in the United States. And so it's up to us as men to be responsible allies in this fight and not to dominate this conversation, but make sure we're doing everything we can to amplify and empower those voices. So it's advocacy and responsible allyship as men when we show up. Fellas, I, I sincerely love you guys. My mom has a saying. She says, behind every successful child is an astonished parent. And uh, I just want you all to know you all are astonishingly good uh, in, in your advocacy. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep working. And when we get this done, let's pick up the next issue and the next issue, because we have got a long way to go. Uh, to deal with a lot of the inequities we're, that are facing women in this country uh, and that are facing uh, uh, birthing people in particular. So just grateful. Thank you, fellas. Uh, I hope to see you in person sometime soon. Uh, and uh, Charles, we got to do something about Lexus's overabundance of hair, man. 
I know, gotta, man. Listen, he needs to make. We need to get like he needs to do some some crowdsourcing and get us straight. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I we gonna, get us straight. Hope there's not a hazing ritual here where I get my head. Yeah. <laughs> we Charles and I are going to come on and do an AMA on uh, grooming techniques. Seriously. Ask me anything about how to shave your head. All right. Listen, seriously, simple. <laughs> simple. All right. we, if we could raise some money for a good cause, I would do it. Oh my gosh, Ooh. you heard it here. Right everybody now. everybody might, heard that, right? Wait, this is not being Everybody recorded. heard that. Oh, this is live. Ah, Alexis, this ah, is live. Ah, it's a done deal. Love, you I thought you raise a lot of good money for a good cause. All right. Well, this is, All right. There'll be part two. There'll be, we'll look for we'll look for version two of this. I, I mean, uh, home like, alone I mean two. You're, you're a handsome guy. It's going to work for you. Thanks, man. It's going to work I, for you, man. You got a good face. You got a good face. All right. I'll be more aerodynamic. All right. <laughs> Kamala Harris is now regretting she put the three of us together, but we're going to cause some good trouble here soon. Good. All right. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, gentlemen. We really you know. appreciate you Thanks, more than you know. You Thank You're you. light workers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Hello, I'm Dr. Kathy Hartke, social action leader for the Wisconsin United Methodist Women. I have spent my career as an obstetrician gynecologist, delivering babies and improving the health of women and infants. Sadly, in Wisconsin and the United States, Maternal deaths are increasing, as in my state. As the co-chair of Wisconsin Maternal Mortality Review Team, five years ago, we reviewed about 25 deaths per year. In 2020, that has increased to nearly 50 maternal deaths in Wisconsin. African-American women in my state are five times more likely to die in pregnancy, and Black infant mortality has not improved. One third of maternal deaths occur 42 days after delivery. Medical complications of pregnancy continue after the birth. However, many women lose their insurance coverage after 60 days and are unable to get needed treatment and medication. This crisis is affecting mothers and families within our churches and communities. It is a moral imperative to address this injustice and provide access to life-saving maternal care. I urge you to support the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2021. Together, we can work toward the day when all women have a healthy birth experience. My name is Dr. Tamika Augustine. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist practicing in Washington, DC, and a member of the American College of Obstetricians Gynecologists Board of Directors. AGOG is grateful to Vice President Harris for her leadership and commitment to addressing our country's maternal mortality crisis. ACOG recognizes its position as a leading national organization of women's health physicians and treats this responsibility with reverence and humility. Addressing our nation's rising maternal mortality rate, which disproportionately affects Black and Indigenous birthing people, is a paramount priority. We are committed to changing the culture of medicine, eliminating inequities in women's health, and confronting bias and individual and systemic racism in the healthcare system. This work also involves diversifying the physician workforce and engaging with a variety of partners to address health disparities and promote equity in care access and delivery. ACOG is grateful for the opportunity to partner with the administration and be part of the Day of Action. Together, we can make strides to improve maternal health and advance policies that not only save moms' lives, but also help them thrive. I'm Dr. Malika Fair with the AEMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges. Despite being an emergency physician, I still face some of the same fears and challenges that many mothers who look like me experience during their pregnancy and delivery. These are real issues, and we have a real maternal health crisis in our nation. The AMC and its members, medical schools and teaching hospitals are committed to improving the health of mothers and infants and achieving health equity in our communities through our research, education, healthcare, and community collaborations. Recently, we launched the AMC Center for Health Justice to help drive this work. The center is focused on a multifaceted approach to eliminate inequities and offers a space for us to come out of our silos and work together. To join us, visit aamchealthjustice.org. Hello, my name is Angela Doinsala Aina, and I am the co founder and executive director of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. I want to express my gratitude to the president, vice president, and every decision maker fighting to ensure that key pieces of maternal health investments remain in the Build Back Better Act.
The Black Mamas Matter Alliance is a national network of Black women-led organizations and multidisciplinary professionals that provide training, conduct research, analyze policy, and amplify Black women's leadership, all to advance Black maternal health rights and justice. With a highly preventable maternal death rate and shortages of healthcare providers across the nation, it is vital to have policies that systematically address the maternal health crisis now. Everything from expanding postpartum Medicaid coverage to a year, increasing educational opportunities to grow the pipeline of culturally congruent midwives and doulas, to funding community-based maternal mental health and wraparound services are some of the important aspects of this act because our alliance are the experts doing the work on the ground to improve the lives of birthing people and their families. The story of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance lies in the successful impact of our founding and annual celebration of the National Black Maternal Health Week campaign every April 11th through the 17th. We are excited and thankful for this administration's commitment to addressing health inequities through the Build Back Better Act and today's Maternal Health Day of Action. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about the systemic challenges women face when seeking maternal health. Bringing a child into this world is a beautiful thing. Women are fierce carriers of life. When I was in Congress, I served on the Black Maternal Health Caucus because maternal health is important to me, both as someone who has raised a child as a single mother, but also because Native women experience many of the same barriers to care that Black women do. During my pregnancy, I was not rich. I didn't have the means to afford specialized care, but there was a program in New Mexico that ensured Medicaid covered my midwife, who aided in the healthy birth of my child, Soma. I utilized WIC for proper nutrition and guidance as I went through my pregnancy and in Soma's first few years of life. Mothers of all income levels deserve access to the experience and care they need so that they can bring healthy babies into the world. As we learned during this terrible pandemic, not all communities have access to the tools needed to access health care. Communities of color were more likely to be essential workers and therefore more at risk of contracting the virus. Many couldn't afford internet for telehealth or didn't have health insurance or even paid family leave. Expect expectant mothers have been living in these conditions for years and years. But now with the transformative bipartisan infrastructure law, we have the tools to build the resources that are so crucial to maternal health, including water infrastructure, universal broadband internet, and a focus on ensuring marginalized communities are no longer left behind. The president also signed a piece of the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act earlier this year. It was a bill that I was proud to co-sponsor during my time in Congress to address the unique risk factors facing veterans during and after their pregnancies, but we're not done. The Biden-Harris administration's Build Back Better agenda will continue to invest in maternal health through the expansion of Medicaid and the Child Health Insurance Program, new investments in the maternal health workforce, and funding for the Office of Minority Health. It is my hope that this panel sheds light on the proactive steps we can take to make sure every mother and baby has access to the health care and services they need to lead healthy lives. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. It's an honor to be joining each and every one of you for this maternal health day of action. You know, when I gave birth to my baby girl in 2018, she became the first newborn allowed on the Senate floor. But through my nine months of pregnancy and my time in labor, I wasn't thinking about changing the Senate rules. I was thinking about staying healthy. From hectic moments in the delivery room to the sleepless postpartum days, every woman who has given birth understands that having access to high quality maternal care providers can make all the difference in the world. 
while I'm lucky to be healthy and have and have two beautiful, healthy girls, I know there are so many women across the country who can't say the same because their pain and symptoms were ignored or overlooked. I know because I've seen the stats, I've read the horror stories, and today's discussion will help underscore that we have a maternal and postpartum care problem in this country. That we're the only developed nation in the world where the rate of women dying of pregnancy-related preventable complications is still rising. For Black women especially, the rising maternal mortality rate and medical racism in our country is a true crisis. On average, 75 women in Illinois die each year from pregnancy-related deaths, but more than 80% of those deaths are preventable. That means daughters and sons growing up without their mothers by their sides, partners left to raise kids on their own and shoulder the burden of providing for a family by themselves. The thing is, we can do something about this. With the Build Back Better Act, we can strengthen our care infrastructure to make sure that every mother and child receives the high quality maternal and postpartum care that they deserve and require. Equally important, today's event will help demonstrate in terms that are both tragic and infuriating why our nation desperately needs the Build Back Better Act to pass. Why it is so critical that we grow our parental workforce and hire more diverse providers, including physicians, nurses, and doulas, so that more providers understand the unique care that different patients of all identities require. And why we much encourage state Medicaid programs to implement innovative maternal home health models. It's simple. We're one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. We shouldn't be among the most fatal for new moms in the developed world too. And we don't have to be. By passing the Build Back Better Act's landmark maternal health provisions, we can become a nation that embodies family values by truly valuing families, ending racial disparities in maternal care, and saving moms' lives across the, the country. And in doing so, President Biden, congressional Democrats, and the dedicated champions here today will make dramatic progress in supporting families from coast to coast. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather so she can share her story with us today. Thank you so much, Senator Duckworth. My name is Heather Wilson, and I'm the founder of Kennedy's Angel Gowns. I'd love to share my story with you. In 2009, my husband and I were delighted to find out that we were expecting. What was an uneventful and beautiful pregnancy suddenly turned into a first-time mother's worst nightmare. I was diagnosed with preeclampsia pre -eclampsia in my third trimester. Doctors scheduled an induction, but I never made it to what was supposed to be my daughter's birth date. On August 17th, 2009, my worst nightmare came true. We were told words that no parent is ever ready or can prepare themselves to hear. We were told there is no longer a heartbeat. Shortly after the on-call doctor told us that our daughter passed away, I was being prepared to deliver my deceased baby. As they prepped me, my body literally decided to go in shock and I was now grieving and fighting for my own life. The loss was devastating. Uh, with my daughter's death just came the loss of hopes and dreams and, and visions that we had for her. Uh, we, we had dreams of her first day at kindergarten or my husband walking her down the aisle. Um, and all that just, it vanished within moments. And I can tell you as someone who's experienced loss in this way, not only is it devastating, but there's nothing that can prepare you to be a mom with empty arms. Being in a hospital with other babies that are crying and celebratory balloons, is, it's very triggering to, to be in that situation. The pain, um, the anguish, the despair, it's, it's truly unimaginable. I fought for years through depression and anxiety from the grief I experienced, and I made it my passion to truly turn my pain into passion. Um, I founded Kennedy's Angel Gowns in 2017 to honor my daughter and to have somewhere to put my pain. One thing I remember when Kennedy was born is not having a burial gown or anything small enough to fit her. 
she was born five pounds. And um, so we decided to take donated wedding, drowns, wedding gowns and convert them into burial gowns for babies gone too soon. We also provide angel boxes that allow families to capture memories while in the hospital and um, when they return home. It's like so many parents who experience this, one of the issues I faced was just the, the ability to spend time kind of soaking up the essence of, of my sweet baby girl. Like any new parent, we wanted to count her fingers and, and make memories. And when you have a stillbirth, that time is cut very short. All I wanted was more time with Kennedy. As a result, uh, we donated a private and serene bereavement suite to local hospital. We named the room the Butterfly Room. This space is one of a kind and it's the first in the state of Virginia. It allows families the gift of time. The space comes equipped with a cooling bassinet and often is referred to as a cuddle cot or a carrying cradle. This journey for me has been life-changing and I've made it my passion to help other women who might walk in my shoes. What I've done recently is become a doula because statistically it's shown that doulas save lives. Um, it's launched me in a direction that I can be that support to a woman hands-on in the delivery room as she either births a live child or in a case uh, where I need to be a birth coach to a, a, a baby that's deceased, I can be a bereavement doula. Uh, in this role, I'm part of the birthing process and I serve as support to the mom, the husband as well. And uh, my other duties also in, serve to just really improve the healthcare and be an advocacy and a voice for that mom. One in four women will be forced to navigate the loss of a child without proper resources they deserve. Legislation that enforces guidelines, holds medical professionals accountable, and withholds equitable and competent care can save lives. Looking back, I wasn't really told the seriousness of preeclampsia um, or the outcomes that affect Black women that have preeclampsia or what they face. As a result, uh, my daughter is no longer with us and our family is missing a huge piece of our hearts. My hope is that you will join me and fight to save lives. You can visit Kennedy's Angel Gowns to join our mission and our vision. As a mother who has experienced the loss of a child, I can't help but let my experience fuel change and support for other moms. By sharing my story and support for families as a doula, I'm hoping for a better tomorrow for all mothers and all babies. I hope you'll join me in the fight. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. So generous and courageous of you to share your story today and to turn your grief into action. I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Vanessa next to hear her story. Good morning, everyone, and I'm so honored to be among all of you courageous leaders, Senator Duckworth and Dr. Whitehair, and to all the, the, my fellow panelists. I'm truly honored. Um, I'm also really grateful to share my story about maternal health on the Navajo Reservation. My story starts 43 years ago at um, Tuba City Indian Health Service, where um, my mom gave birth to me. And I was told that she barely made it to the hospital because we live in such a rem remote community of Black Mesa in the Western um, part of Navajo Nation. And um, I happened you know, to be born on a very, um, heavy snowfall night and so she had to scramble to find um, somebody to take her because we needed a or she needed a four-wheel um, vehicle to get her to the clinic and so she actually made it there just in time and I was delivered um, in Tuba City an hour and a half away from um, our family home 
And fast forward to present day, I now have a six-year-old daughter and an almost two-year-old son who were both born at the same clinic that I was born at. And they were both delivered via C-section. Um, and like many people, I had complications. Um, I had gestational diabetes early into uh, my pregnancy. And, um, you know, coming home after my C-section, I remember so clearly the extreme pain I was going through, um, driving on the rough roads, holding my stomach, and really driving down the same road that my mom traveled to have me. And um, when I returned home, you know, I returned home to a cold home. We heat our homes with wood stoves and, you know, to a home that had no running water. So for many people on the reservation, um, they don't have electricity or running water yet. And, you know, with um, the option of telehealth, we really still don't have that because we don't have broadband or cell phone coverage. Um, just the, the remoteness um, provides so many challenges, including, you know, my diagnosis of um, gestational diabetes, um, being that we don't have um, running water, we have to haul our water several miles away from a well and that, um, you know, we have to travel an hour to get fresh fruits and vegetables really um, impacted, I think, my, my health and having the, the gestational diabetes. Um, many patients um, in the Indian health service system have traumatic experiences and I know I did growing up visiting at the IHS clinic. We didn't have a single provider. We were just given whoever was there. Um, and so when I knew my only option was um, IHS for my prenatal care, my delivery, I was really scared. And um, I just, you know, heard so many horror stories. So, um, I just knew I wasn't going to get a provider that was dedicated to my care. Um, but I'm here today to tell you I was absolutely wrong because um, I found Dr. Whitehair, and I'm incredibly blessed um, that she was my OBGYN. Um, she's likely the only um, Navajo OBGYN provider on the reservation, and um, it made all the difference. Um, when I first met her, she um, told me her father was Black Ma from Black Mesa as well. And just knowing that she's, she's from the same community that I'm from and the warmth and, the, and really the advocacy that she provided um, for my well-being, not just during my prenatal, but um, all the care afterwards. She was always there, you know, checking up, making sure my family was doing okay. And um, for me, just to see a Navajo woman to be able to exceed, you know, my expectations of what a provider should be was really empowering. Um, and it changed the course of motherhood for me. Um, I really don't have a way to describe it. I, you know, say my fortune, um, just to describe that my fortune um, is that my spiritual being and my cultural values became whole when um, Dr. Whitehair became my provider. In conclusion, I just want to urge each and every one of you that we must support diversifying providers and investing to make systemic changes for our children. Um, simply, simply put, giving birth is truly a sacred um, experience and it deserves all the resources. Um, and I just want to say, I don't want to see my daughter um, bringing home her newborn to a place that still lacks basic infrastructure. Um, we just can't allow another 43 years to pass us by without seeing any changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to hear from Dr. Whitehair in a little bit, but first we're going to go to Stephanie. 
Hi, I'm Stephanie Monroe from Rural, Colorado. My journey in pregnancy began 12 years ago with my twins. I was a high risk pregnancy and the doctor in our area told me that they were unable to treat me in this area because of the high risk. I traveled three times a week to Denver, which is about a two and a half hour drive for, from our home. Um, and let me tell you, being pregnant with twins at the end was a very uncomfortable two and a half hour drive. Um, luckily, I had the one natural, one with C-section. And they are healthy little boys at the moment. Then we fast forward 12 years and I was feeling very ill and wasn't sure what was wrong with me. Called into my doctor, could not get into my normal provider. It was two weeks out. So I ended up seeing a physician who was here as a resident in training. Um, very lucky, he was a wonderful doctor and found out I was 20 weeks pregnant. I'm 40 years old, so again, a high risk pregnancy. I was terrified, absolutely blown away by this as I thought I was in menopause and very, very stressed out. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of mental health providers in our area that could do any kind of counseling for what I needed. I was lucky enough to go to Dr. McLaughlin and he brought everything into perspective for me. We did all sorts of diagnosis and treatments and fetal monitoring and tests and making sure that the baby was going to be okay. Um, all of these had to be done out of town once again. So therefore we drove an hour and a half, two hours away. Um, coming back to Sterling, my doctor was amazing and talked to me about every diagnosis and prognosis of what could happen and what was going on with my pregnancy being that I was so far along had had no real care at that point and that I was a geriatric pregnancy at this point um, I decided that I did not want to have a regular c-section again I wanted to go for a regular vaginal birth and once again, in our area being so rural, they would not allow us to do a vaginal birth as I'd already had a C-section. So we were forced to drive an hour and a half away. Um, we had it set up for the 27th of November. Thank goodness we drove up the night before because I ended up in the hospital on the 26th and was able to vaginally deliver a healthy baby boy. Um, but if we would have had any kind of storms or bad weather, the travel could have been devastating to us as well. And in the hospital, they talked to you about going home and having care with post and prenatal care and mental health. And there's really nothing in our area that supports that. Also having a lactation, provider or somebody to coach us in that area. There's not really a whole lot in our rural area that does that. That would be a huge step in our area to get this and some more mental health awareness for just the anxiety and scared women out there of what could happen as being an older adult giving birth in a rural area. Um, the inconvenience of not being able to see a doctor or find a pediatrician in our area is very difficult as the providers that we do have are amazing, but they are completely booked up and usually two to three weeks out. So when you have an issue with a newborn or yourself as you're pregnant, it's very difficult to get in. Um, like I said, once again, I was very, very lucky to find Dr. McLaughlin, who within days would see you or call you and talk you through whatever was going on. Um, we are also in a very rural area where telehealth and internet connections, as you guys saw, I lost internet earlier, is very difficult to do. 
So I'm just hoping that we can move forward and get some more providers and services in our area that can help women and children in this rural area. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, the, the internet part we have uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure deal that the president signed into law last week, um, uh, significant uh, investments in, infra in uh, 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 infrastructure for the internet. So hopefully everybody is gonna have access to broadband. Um, I'm, we're gonna now turn to our clinicians, beginning with Dr. Bell, if you could tell your story a little bit, and then Dr. Whitehair will follow Dr. Bell. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be here today and to share uh, with you my experiences and my, my story. Uh, I am Dr. Veronica Gillespie Bell. I am an OBGYN at Ochsner Health here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, I have been giving care to patients in the New Orleans area for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, I am very well experienced with the challenges that our Black women face in accessing care and also in the bias in the care that they receive. Um, it is for that reason that a lot of Black patients seek me out as a Black provider. They know that we have shared cultural experiences. They know that when they come and see me that I will hear them and that I will see them. But they tell me that I'm a unicorn. There are so few Black providers. Um, in fact, in 2018, the American Association of Medical Colleges did a survey of active physicians and found that only 5% of physicians identify as Black, um, about 6% identify as Latinx, and less than 1% identify as Indigenous. And we know that when there's concordance of race between the patient and the provider, we have better outcomes. If we know that there is such a lack of diversity in providers, what does this say for our Black families? What does it say for our Latinx families, for our Indigenous families, if they don't have a workforce that looks like them? I have to say that I am incredibly grateful to Xavier University of Louisiana, as well as Meharry Medical College. They are my two alma maters and two historically Black colleges and universities. Um, these two institutions saw not only who I was at the time, but what I would become and what I would do for our community. And so we have to invest in our HBCUs because they will invest in us and in our communities. Um, as I think about how we expand the workforce here at Oshner, we have partnered with Xavier University to develop a physician assistance program so that we have a diversity of providers in the workforce and so that that workforce is also diverse. And so I think that other programs like this and other partnerships like this should exist across the United States to help diversify that workforce. Uh, I also bring to you my experience with telehealth. So here at Oshner, we have a digital health program called Connected Mom. And in this program, moms are given blood pressure cuffs and they're given also uh, scales so that they're able to take these vital signs and they upload to their medical record through their Bluetooth device. I can tell you that through this program, I have been able to diagnose mothers with preeclampsia in between their traditional visits. And I can tell you that we also see better blood pressure control for our moms that have hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And during the pandemic, and then also Hurricane Ida, where I and my patients were displaced, we did not experience interruption in care because we had these devices. But as we look to expand telehealth, even though we know those benefits, we have to be ready to address the barriers to digital health medicine. Those barriers being access, being affordability, and digital health literacy. We've already heard from Stephanie as well as Vanessa um, that in rural America, if we do not address the infrastructure, then we're going to see our disparity gap get even wider as we expand telehealth. And this is why we need to see the Build Back, Build Back Better Act pass so that we can address those barriers. I also bring to you my experiences as the medical director of the Louisiana Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review and the Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative, two programs under the Louisiana Department of Health. Under the Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review, or we call it PAMR, we review all maternal deaths at the time of pregnancy up to one year uh, after pregnancy, regardless of the cause. 
Um, I think that in doing this, these maternal reviews and doing these reports, it's been eye-opening to the causes of maternal death. We do know that hemorrhage and hypertension are the two leading clinical causes of maternal death, but the three top causes of maternal death in Louisiana in 2018 were substance use disorder, motor vehicle collisions, and also homicide. And so that really speaks to the fact that if we're going to address maternal mortality, we have to address those clinical causes in the hospital, but we also have to, uh, have to address those social factors that determine our health. And we know that through systemic inequities that historically, people that are in black and brown communities have negative impacts on their social determinants of health, and it is affecting their maternal outcomes. And so this is why we need to see, again, the Build Back Better, Build Back Better Act, as well as the Momnibus Act passed, because it does help to address some of those social determinants of health that are leading to those maternal deaths. And then when we look at those deaths, the majority of them were after 42 days or after six weeks. We have to stop thinking about postpartum period as a six week time period. It really is up to a year after pregnancy. And so it is so exciting to hear the investments that are being made to ensure that Medicaid is going to be extended to up to one year um, after postpartum. Here in Louisiana, 62% of our births are covered by Medicaid. So this is a significant change for our families in, in Louisiana. And then finally, as the medical director of the Perinatal Quality Collaborative, I am here to say that improvement is possible. Change is possible. Through our Perinatal Quality Collaborative, we launched in August 18, 2018, with the goal of reducing maternal morbidity related to hemorrhage and hypertension, as well as narrowing that black-white disparity gap. We've heard uh, a lot of data today about the black-white disparity gap in Louisiana is not um, different than the rest of the country where uh, black women experience three to four times the rate of maternal mortality from pregnancy-related deaths. And so as we launched our initiative, it was important for us that if we were gonna improve outcomes for anyone, we were gonna improve outcomes for everyone. And so that meant addressing the black-white disparity gap and those drivers of the disparities being implicit bias and systemic racism. Working with our birthing facilities, I'm proud to say that we have seen a reduction in severe maternal morbidity from hemorrhage by 35% a reduction for black women by 49%, and a reduction from severe maternal morbidity from hypertension by 12%. We as a perinatal quality collaborative use improvement science to work with our birthing facilities to implement the AIM bundles to make sure that every facility has readiness, response, recognition for those leading causes of maternal morbidity and mortality. We talk about mortality because that's more, it's easily measured, but we have to remember for every case of mortality, there's a thousand cases of morbidity. The mortality is just the tip of the iceberg, but we do know that change is possible. And so it's going to take all of us, as has been said today, it's gonna to take patients, providers, all of the private and public sectors that are represented here today to see change, but change is possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Bell. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Whitehair now to talk about the challenges in Indian country as well as over your experience overall. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm having extreme technical difficulties. I can hear you. Okay, yes, Dr. Right. And then thank after you, you will be Shelley. So thank you, Madam Vice President Harris and distinguished Congress members for the opportunity to speak and bring attention to such an important conversation in regards to maternal morbidity and mortality and the chance to represent the unique challenges that indigenous women face. Good morning and yate abena to my community that is watching this morning. My name is Dr. Jennifer Whitehair, and I'm a board certified Navajo obstetrician and gynecologist practicing on the Navajo reservation for the past 16 years. As a minority woman myself and having delivered my last child on the reservation, the mort maternal mortality rate is of great concern to me. Women of color carry a disproportionate burden of maternal mortality. In Arizona alone, American women and Alaska Native women have the highest pregnancy associated maternal mortality ratio, and 100% of these deaths were considered to be preventable. 
The severe maternal morbidity rate was the highest for American Indians and Alaska Natives at over three and a half times the rate for non-Hispanic white women. And the severe maternal mortality rate was again the highest for women living in rural communities versus women living in urban communities. It's important for this data to be analyzed and mandates to be enforced to change this trajectory for the future of our people. Strict adherence and awareness of safety bundles that are in alliance with, <clears throat> with it, um, that are in alliance with the, for innovation on maternal health, as well as the California Maternal Care Collaborative, in addition with standardized protocols would be an in integral step in improving care. Next, I believe, that we can bring awareness to implicit bias and racism in medicine through awareness and training. <clears throat> Patients connect with providers that look and sound like them and understand their cultural needs. I would like to see medical schools that train native physicians and mid-level providers on reservations so that we can home grow our own providers. I myself participated in the Indians into Medicine program at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine. This program held seven spots in the class for Indigenous students. It was important for me to see that there were other people that looked like me that could have its success. People that looked like I did and learned like I did and struggled the same way that I did. This is one reason why pathways into medicine are imperative for Native high school students. Opening tribally affiliated medical schools that train Native providers is critical in the continuity of care in these isolated and rural Indigenous communities. This is a very important step in taking care of our own people. I also believe it is important to see more resources allocated to Indian Health Service facilities to bring highly skilled providers to areas that have difficulty with recruitment. I would like to emphasize the importance of evidence-based midwifery models, which are shown to improve overall care and time spent with laboring patients, as well as decrease C-section rates. Telehealth services are vital in improving care in rural populations, but since most of my patients have no access to internet, this becomes virtually impossible. And as you can see today, I can barely get on the internet myself. There are so many basic infrastructure needs such as running water and electricity, as Vanessa alluded to earlier, that need to be addressed. And this is sometimes difficult to pinpoint a starting place when we are facing these, this many issues. My hope for the future of improving care to the indigenous maternal population would also include an emphasis on mental health facilities, domestic violence shelters, and substance abuse and rehab programs. Improving these areas and allocating funds would make a large impact on overall maternal health. In summary, the key areas that I would like to advocate for are resources allocated to enforce safety bundles and standardized protocols, training of native providers in tribal affiliated areas, and funds allocated to improve infrastructure and services such as domestic violence shelters, substance abuse, abuse and mental health services, and finally, thank you to each and every panel member for advocating for our indigenous women in our community and know that our community also stands behind the African-American community in solidarity in fighting this maternal crisis. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Dr. Whitehair. We're now gonna turn to uh, Shelly Lopez Gray, who um, is a nurse who knows all about the good work nurses do every day, but also the secret good work that nurses do. And thank you for being very patient, Shelly. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Shelly Lopez Gray, and I'm a senior consultant for Perkinomer, and I've dedicated um, my career to optimizing outcomes for women and babies. As a nurse, I've provided care in small community settings and at larger academic facilities, and I've really seen firsthand the systemic issues and disparities present in uh, women's care, especially in maternal newborn nursing. The adoption by hospitals and healthcare systems to standardize best practices for women will help ensure safe care for every woman who gives birth in the United States, regardless of race, ethnicity, or even location. As a consultant for Perkin Elmer, I've had a chance to work with uh, providers from all over the United States. And the one thing that I can say for certain is that care is different where, uh, where it's rendered. And this should not be the case. As a nurse that has worked in two very, very different settings, I can tell you with absolute certainty, many, many outcomes are directly correlated with where you give birth. Um, it surprises people when I say that I've seen a maternal death for every single year that I've been a nurse. 
And any labor and delivery nurse will tell you that they have witnessed too many close calls to count. Um, the majority of these deaths um, are completely preventable. Um, as a former telemedicine maternal fetal medicine nurse, routine and specialized services uh, need to be available to provide access to care. And specifically, I mean, this care needs to be standardized. It needs to be up to date. It needs to be evidence-based care, especially during times of uncertainty, whether that's from a pandemic or a natural disaster. Um, we really must find innovative ways to provide uh, health care so services to pregnant women. In Texas, for example, uh, we frequ frequently uh, have taken care of displaced women from Louisiana after, you know, like after a hurricane. And one of the last maternal deaths uh, that I witnessed, a pregnant woman came in bleeding. Um, she had a baby blanket between her legs and the fetal heart tones were so low, um, it was warranted that she have an emergency cesarean delivery. But I wonder if the outcome would have been different if we would have known her, her health history. And I've written about it, uh, but to this day, I can still remember how difficult it was to give chest compressions to someone who we had just delivered with breast milk slipping through our fingers. Um, you know, and no one really being able to get uh, a, their, a good grip um, on our chest. Uh, no one, no one delivers a baby thinking that they won't come home um, from the hospital. Um, so in order to tackle uh, the vexing issue of maternal morbidity and mortality, we really do need to strive um, to provide equitable access um, to care. So the number one cause of maternal death in the United States is related to cardiovascular conditions and the majority of pregnancy related deaths occurred during the first year following the birth of a baby, which many, many people have mentioned. But in the US, roughly half of births are covered by Medicaid, but currently pregnant women only qualify for state Medicaid coverage for up to 60 days after the birth of their baby. So on a more personal note, um, I was told that 21 weeks at a normal, you know, 21 week ultrasound appointment that my baby had something wrong with his brain. I delivered preterm at 35 weeks. I had severe preeclampsia and my son spent weeks in the NICU, an event that, I mean, nothing can mentally prepare you for not even being an obstetrical nurse. Um, I would like every member of Congress and anyone listening to know that even though I was a healthcare provider with an advanced degree and I had access to care that isn't available to most women, the majority of my pregnancy induced complications were diagnosed three to nine months after I gave birth to my son. Um, and these complications included mild kidney failure, eye issues that required laser surgery, uh, cardiomyopathy that subsequently led to heart failure. And I really feel as a society that we forgot about women, that we forget about women after they birth, um, you know, they give birth to their baby. And it's this thought that drives me as a nurse, um, and it should really drive all of us to work together um, because we can and we have to do better uh, for women and their families. I came so close to being a statistic. I, I'm hearing everyone else's stories. I was so close to being a statistic, but what frightens me so much more as a healthcare provider is that roughly half of all women who give birth may not even have medical coverage to even be evaluated. That's a very, very scary thought. Um, so you. just, in, go ahead. No, 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 finish your thought. Oh, well, I was just gonna say, um, you know, and I would really like to uh, thank all of you uh, for coming together and for supporting, you know, uh, what we advocate for. I'm a very proud member of, the Association of uh, Women's Health, Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses, and ACOG, and uh, of course, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And we really have to work together um, so that we can tackle all of these issues that affect everyone because absolutely no one deserves to, uh, to go home from the hospital uh, without their mother.
thank you thank, thank you, you so for much. your thank you for your um comments and i will say that um there is up to one year of post um birth care now for medicaid uh recipients but it's state by state uh, uh it's available we pass that at the federal level illinois my home state was the first state in the nation to accept it and so we now have that but uh, in other states, uh, uh, unfortunately, okay. it's dependent on politics, whether or not your governor is willing to accept legislation pushed through by the Biden administration and, yes. and congressional yes. Democrats. So hopefully you'll eventually get some common sense there. Um, Heather, I, I wanted to touch on you a little bit on doulas. Um, uh, you know, in the Build Back Better Act, uh, we make an unprecedented $50 million investment in expanding the doula workforce in America. You touch a little bit on your work as doula, but can you talk a little bit about how doulas can really affect health outcomes and how important it is to grow this workforce? Absolutely. So it is uh, support through touch, is support through talk, and it's just having that knowledge and being the voice and the advocate. And um, as many mentioned, it's, it's not just a month or a couple of weeks after the mom gives birth, it's continued care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, uh, the high quality and respectful care you receive from Dr. Whitehair is not the norm. And as you said, you were surprised, pleasantly surprised. Can you provide some examples of why the Build Back Better funding to diversify maternity care workforce and increase the number of Native American maternal health care professionals? would make an important uh, uh, contribution and impact on Native American moms? Just the sheer number of available um, providers. It's incredibly important. Um, like I said, I think Dr. Whitehair is probably the one of the only um, Navajo providers out there. And um, that really takes a look at the the challenges of getting our um, children into um, a place where they feel valued and to be able to become doctors. And I think there's just a whole missing piece, um, a structure there that's been, you know, there's just absolutely no support um, even up into college, you don't hear a lot of um, children being supported in um, getting to a place where they can go to med school and have that support. And um, for me, especially um, being that um, I'm, I was in such a remote area, um, you know, the entire system looking at my kids, um, and looking at the whole cycle of life, you just see that there are so many gaps. And I feel like um, by bridging those gaps and providing support in some of the ways that Dr. Whitehair outlined is really important. Um, the ways that she provided care was a lot of one-on-one -on -one and um, that cultural connection, I think, for many viewers, they don't understand how important our spiritual, traditional, um, cultural values um, plays a role in our mental health moving forward. You know, you can't take that piece out. And so when Dr. Whitehair talks about the way we learn differently, the way, um, uh, you know, our Native people are structured differently, um, that has to be recognized. And um, I, and it's just a whole entire connected piece, I feel like. Um, so what we're talking about today is just a powerful um, approach on entire family health. So I, um, I don't know if I answered your question. I, you no, know, it's just yeah. really, I think, so important to, um, to tribal, communities that we diversify our providers. Um, we we just don't. I mean, it's so rare that I was able to have a native provider and so extremely lucky. And I don't think people realize that my story is probably, you know, one in, you know, the 300,000 or so Navajo people that live out there. I'm pretty sure I'm one of the few that actually had a Navajo woman deliver my kid, kids. 
Thank you, Stephanie. We're, we're running out of time, but I wanted, um, I'm, thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to send this next question to Stephanie. Um, uh, you talked a little bit about the importance of um, uh, community-based care. We just talked about how important it is on the Navajo uh, reservations. Um, Stephanie, if we pass Build Back Better, there's gonna be a lot of money in there to develop capacity in community-based uh, providers for everything from specialists or trained, not just prenatal care, but also post uh, birth. So for people who could identify and treat postpartum depression, anxiety, substance abuse and use disorders, what kind of uh, impact would it make to have more community-based providers both pre and after pregnancy? It would be so huge for our communities to have somebody to talk to prenatal, postnatal, um, just the substance abuse issues in our small area are so huge. And I've seen it within our small community of women who have had babies and that being part of their issue. Um, rather than having somebody to speak to, they go to drugs or alcohol to cope with what's going on. And I think to have somebody to go speak with would very much help this situation in our area. Also, just the fact that trying to find somebody to talk to for mental health issues is a huge thing where they don't take insurance or they don't take your insurance or you once again are driving two hours to have them where they do take insurance. It has been a huge issue for many of the women in our area. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna wrap up and say that thank you for sharing your stories today um, and for participating in today's panel. Um, I want to in particular thank um, Heather for sharing your story of grief and, and, and giving us, motivating us with your uh, work now as a doula. Vanessa, your, your comments on um, what it's like for uh, women on tribal, uh, in our First Nations on tribal lands um, is really valuable. And Stephanie, thank you also for shining a light on rural communities and, and the need for postpartum care as well. It's clear that we have to do better and keep up our work to achieve a true uh, maternal health justice. And we can start by passing the Build Back Better Act. I'm ready to get back to the Senate and do all that I can to make sure that we deliver this historic landmark legislation for women and families all across the country. And for our clinicians, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for caring for all of those moms out there. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. And I hope that you do well and have a wonderful holiday season. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Rice, director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. When I was 12 years old, I discovered that I once had a twin brother. He was stillborn. And one possible explanation my mother offered as she sought to make sense of this devastating tragedy was that she had an obstetrician she had never liked or trusted. She said her doctor back then was always dismissive of her concerns. My mom suspected that he might have missed something very important. Those what ifs haunt me to this day. By contrast, some 20 years later, when I started having children, I was fortunate to have a first rate OBGYN an African-American woman doctor who was also a trusted friend. I believe that part of the reason why I had two relatively smooth pregnancies and postpartum periods is because I had a caring, attentive doctor who respected me and listened to me. Today's event has been a powerful reminder of how personal and painful maternal health issues are for so many women, and of the disparate toll maternal complications take on black women and other women of color. We've heard from senators, congresswomen, and cabinet secretaries, public health officials, and one of the most decorated Olympians of all time, and one of my daughter's personal heroes, Allison Felix. We've listened to heartbreaking stories of Americans from every background who've lived and sometimes died from this trauma. Stories that echoed ones we heard at a maternal health roundtable that Vice President Harris and I held together in April. 
Today is a day of action, and I hope what we've heard spurs us all to act with still greater urgency. There's absolutely no reason that in a country as rich and powerful as the United States of America, more woman, women should die during pregnancy than in any other developed nation. There is no reason that black and native women should be two to three times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. There is certainly no reason that maternal mortality rates should be getting worse with more women dying in childbirth today than 25 years ago. I hope our biggest takeaway from today is this. These deaths and complications are not only unacceptable, they are largely preventable. And because they are preventable, we must prevent them. That's why, as you've heard, we're mobilizing the entire federal government to tackle this crisis. We know that maternal health is more than just what happens in a doctor's office. It's affected by what food a pregnant woman has access to, where she lives, how her doctors and nurses are trained. And so we're using every tool in our toolbox, not only the Domestic Policy Council, but our newly established Gender Policy Council, not only the Department of Health and Human Services, but the Departments of Agriculture, Housing and Urban Development, Veterans Affairs, the Interior Department, and the Environmental Protection Agency. We're focused on ensuring that women have a voice in their own health care. Increasing maternal health care access and coverage, enhancing data collection and accountability, expanding and diversifying the workforce that cares for pregnant women so that it reflects the communities it serves. Strengthening the economic and social supports growing families need. As the Vice President and others have underscored, the best way to achieve these goals is to pass President Biden's Build Back Better Act. It doesn't, it doesn't get as much attention as other parts of the legislation, but we are talking about an historic investment, $3 billion in maternal health, it would make postpartum coverage mandatory, not just for 60 days after delivery, but for that entire critical first year. It would invest in everything from training providers on bias and discrimination to increasing the number of nurses and midwives and mental health professionals, to bolstering research, to encouraging innovative maternal health homes that can better coordinate care. Build Back Better would also close the Medicaid coverage gap, allowing millions of women to finally gain access to life-saving health coverage. Here at the White House, we have been working day and night to get this bill passed. And with your support, I'm confident we'll get it done. Ensuring better and more equitable maternal health is something to which President Biden, Vice President Harris, I and the entire Biden-Harris administration remain deeply committed to. So I want to thank you all for your advocacy, for sharing your stories, for your compassion and courage. And let's all leave here more determined than ever to ensure that everyone giving birth in this country, no matter their race, their zip code, or any other factor, is accorded the dignity and receives the care that they deserve. Thank you very much.